Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today's episode is brought to you by Brown Water, specifically Brown Water made by Black Rifle Coffee. If you want to see what Black Rifle Coffee has to offer, consider going to blackriflecoffee.com. And I'm not even going to try to unpack all the things that they have because, Evan, if you're listening, you have too much shit on your website. I'm actually joking about that. They have an amazing amount of offerings, uh, everything from that brown water, the aforementioned brown water that I talked about, to apparel, gear, T-shirts, hats, coffee mugs, uh, things to make coffee with. Hopefully there's not a French press on there because people who make coffee with the French press actually hate themselves. Uh, Pour over is the way to go if you are caring and loving about yourself and other people, but I digress. Head to blackriflecoffee.com. Check out what they have to offer. Support an amazing brand and the amazing people that created the organization. And that's it. My guest today is Michelle Black, and she is an author, among many other things. Her book is called Sacrifice, A Gold Star Widow's Fight for the Truth. Now, obviously, the title of the book lets you know that she is a gold star widow. She lost her husband, Brian, who was a Green Beret. He was killed in Niger, Africa, in an ambush that unfortunately there is video of, it exists, and it hit the mainstream media. Now, the podcast isn't necessarily about that. We talk about that a little bit. It's more about Michelle's fight to understand and determine the actual truth of what happened on the ground in the days leading up to and then the moments of the ambush that took her husband's life. We get pretty deeply into it. Um, the book was fantastic. It was a difficult read for me for reasons that I explain on the podcast, but you can find it anywhere that books are sold. I highly recommend it. Again, it's called Sacrifice. And I'm going to stop talking. Episode number 230 with Michelle Black. Enjoy. I finished your book this morning. Oh, wow. Okay. It was a difficult read for me, not as in uh, the writing style, but the, the content. I can only imagine uh, how hard it was to actually write it, given the subject matter was not only about your husband, um, but the people who were with him. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was a great book. Um, I'll start Thank with you. that. But like I said, it was, I had to break it up into chunks. I find that, uh, you know, some, some military books hit closer to home for me and the ones that don't, I can kind of just blast through them. I also understand the acronym so I get to save time and not go into the glossary. <laughs> that is nice. <laughs> People don't realize how the military is a foreign language. Yeah, I actually did the glossary because of, well, for me, because I had oh, to yeah. research all that. So I understood because we were Brian wasn't in that long, seven years, and I was raised so far from the military that I was like, you do that. I'm going to focus on having a kid on the autism spectrum, IEPs in that language. Yeah. So. It's not a, it's not a language you're going to get credit for in any college system. However, it's. You know what's the worst part about it is that each branch has their own version of that language. It's like dialectual. So yeah. Navy and Marine Corps can kind of talk the same. Marines would, would never want you to know this, but they're actually the Department of the Navy. We call them the men's department, or I do, because let's be honest, they're pretty badass. And then the Army, I can't speak Army at all. Different mm -hmm. acronyms, and you get me around the Air Force, I just I just leave. I have nothing to, <laughs> to do or say with that. But um, where would you like to begin? I'd leave it up to you. Oh, gosh. Um yeah, I'm not even sure where to begin. Uh, How about where you met Brian? Because I'm a California kid, kind of born and raised, and uh, okay. it's not really my neck of the woods where you guys met, but I've been there a few times. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I I was born up there, and I, I left for a really? short time. Yeah, I left when I was probably eight or nine, and then we always, uh, my grandparents, we had a family home up there, so I'd always go up there. So I started snowboarding when I was 12. Um, started racing and competing in different things and um, loved it. That's why I love the weather here. It's like, feels like home. Yeah. I'm like, as long as it's 20s and sunny, I'm happy. We get better snow here. Because <laughs> you're up in Mammoth, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
the snowpack up there is okay. We're talking 160 inches, like base layer sometimes here on the mountain. Okay. I think it's a little bit better. It, it depends on the year, though. Of there course. were times we had 20 foot pack, you know, so there, there were, it was anywhere from like, you know, a few feet to just ridiculous. Yeah. But it would be pretty wet because it would get so hot that, you know, you'd get those melted layers yeah. and slushy days. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. was fun, but you'd Until wake you up fall. in the morning and it's icy. Yeah. In fact, I hurt myself pretty bad <laughs> once doing that. But um, yeah, probably the worst injury was on an icy day going way too fast. Um, yeah. It was fun until you crash, you know. What a cool place to grow up. What was the population there when you were growing up? Who really small. I'd say year round population on average was between 5,000 and 7,000, even when Brian and I were living there as, uh, you know, in our 20s. Yeah. So it was small. You what know? did it swell to in the in the months where tourism would actually kick in? Oh, my gosh. Everyone from the L.A. Basin would yeah. come up. So um, I'm not exactly sure, but my guess would be... Probably double or triple. Oh, yeah. 20, yeah. 30,000. It's very similar here. The people will ask me how many people live in Kalispell, and I don't have a great answer because the Flathead Valley, so the south end of where we are, is the Flathead Lake. <laughs> largest freshwater lake west of Mississippi. Tahoe likes to make some claims to it sometimes. They're not correct if we're huh. using math and measuring. Um, and the north side is Glacier and Whitefish, the ski slopes that you can see. Okay. Um, and then the the mountainous, in air quotes, hilly terrain. They're not quite the mountains that uh, people from like Colorado or the true Rockies <laughs> would recognize. <laughs> yeah. So that whole valley, it's, it's tough because there's bedroom communities in there and I, I don't have a great grasp on the total wintertime population, but in the summer months, it you you feel this massive influx. It's got to be double or triple. Okay. So I'm familiar with that environment as well. I'm going to say I enjoy it more when there's not that influx. Yeah. <laughs> what, you know, one thing about when it's quiet, is it's that, it's that feeling of everybody knows everybody. Yeah. You know, you go out to coffee and it's like, oh, there's Tom. I haven't seen Tom in a while, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's great. Like everybody knows each other. And yeah. uh, when everyone comes in, they come in with the attitude of they own that place. And it's just, it's. <laughs> That's how you get your car keyed. Yeah. Hypothetically. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know much about that, but I have heard rumors. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian was not from there, correct? No, he was not. He was actually um, a military brat. His dad was a Marine officer and um, his family, his parents' family, um, both of them were raised in San Pedro. So all of his uncles and aunts and cousins were in Southern California. So his uncle would take him skiing up in Mammoth all the time. So after he finished college, he came up to Mammoth and I had just finished college and moved back. And um, that's kind of how we met. I was instructing snowboarding. He was teaching, uh, he was playing online poker for a living, actually, so he could ski during the day. Um, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. It was a rough <laughs> life for him. So, <laughs> man, if I had to pick, if I had to choose between a hundred jobs available, I would not go with that one. There's a lot of stress that I can handle. I don't know if I could handle gambling for a living. <laughs> yeah. It, that's just too much for me. Yeah. Well, and it's back when, um, because now restrictions on the banking, banking laws and, and all of that for poker sites, um, I think it was in 2008 that they put heavy restrictions on them, which pushed all of the um, banking for like party poker and all the online poker sites offshore. So then it got really risky because mm. you'd have to use, you know, accounts in like the Cayman Islands or, or wherever. Um, so we, Brian quit doing it in 2008. But before that, all those online um, gambling sites were exploding like party poker. So he actually played uh, for the house. So he got a percentage of every pot. He was playing against the other players? <laughs> Technically, yeah. He, he got paid to be there, you know, so he got a percentage of every pot. So he, yeah. So he was deep. Yeah. He, he was deep. Yep, he was in deep. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known better then, but you know. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know that was possible. I just assumed when you logged on, you were playing against the other players. I had no idea that they would have people paid to be on there. Yeah. And I think he would have played anyway. Um, but when he figured he could do that, he, yeah. It sounds like reading the book that he had a, 
a pretty good mind for strategy and numbers because chess was another thing he spent a lot of time playing as well, right? Yeah, he began at a young age playing chess, and um, by the time he was 11, he had won second at nationals. Um, he was very competitive. Uh, he was known all over his region in Washington State for um, chess. He just was phenomenal. It's one of the misconceptions, and I don't know where it comes from. It might come from Hollywood, I think, but it's that the average military member is somehow of a below average intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's I've seen this one in movies multiple times. Somebody standing in front of the judge. You have two choices. You can go to jail or you can go to the military. And it can it can make it seem as if it's a, um, a choice of last measure for some people. But then you mm -hmm. hear about your husband who by any stretch and by any metric was a very high performer, had a mental capacity that was very high. And those were the people that I worked around in the military, not even just in special operations, but just the military in general. I wish that somehow that misconception could be shifted because that's those are the community of, of people that, that resonates. When I heard that, it made total sense. Like the first cup mm -hmm. of coffee that I ever had, I still am pissed at my buddy to this day. I mean, it's my mid-20s without having a cup of coffee. I didn't understand why people would just hover around this device in the morning and watch as it just drips out. Um, but my buddy loved to play chess, and he took me to a small coffee shop in Uzbekistan and slid me an iced mocha, and the, the rest is just history. And now I can pour espresso down my face, and I don't even care. <laughs> but fascinating guy. He loved history. He was the son of uh, missionaries who had traveled, I'm pretty sure, throughout Africa as well, ended up in the military, and some of the most critical thinkers that I've ever worked with. Um, so, yeah, when I read that, it didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me at all, but I, I feel like it does surprise people the mental capacity, and by that I mean the impressive mental capacity that a lot of military members have. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree because my impression is exactly what you said initially before I met Brian before because I'd never been around military. It was what Hollywood portrayed, you know, and I think it's why um, when what happened to my husband's team happened, uh, media is used and the um, the officers are able to get away with saying, well, you know, they went rogue. They acted like a bunch of cowboys, kind of make them sound like they were bumbling and stupid. Yeah. Um, when, when in, in re reality, it's the exact opposite. No. It's almost like they went through a screening process to make sure they weren't like that. I know. It's odd, isn't it? <laughs> I heard a rumor, too, but I don't want to say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that for sure. But it's. Uh, I hope that narrative changes. They were some mm -hmm. of the... The special operations community, at least I can speak to, has more enlisted college graduates um, than any other uh, branch of the U.S. military. It's it's They're refined for critical thinkers. You're looking for people who aren't going to go cowboyish, whatever that might mean to some people. But yeah, it uh, smart fellas. It's yeah. tough to serve around them sometimes because you look around and you're like, okay, who's the dumbest person in this room? I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> It's me. <laughs> Might be me, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. Often I'd be like, Brian, you're so intelligent. You're like the smartest person there. And he'd always say, no, you're never the smartest person in a room. It keeps you in check, so. though. It's, it's very humbling, but it's also very inspiring when you can see what's actually possible, either physically or between the years for some people. I think it might be what I enjoy the most about that community. <laughs> so how, how long were you guys together before talks of joining the military started? Uh, let's see. We'd met in, I think, 2003 or 2004. We got married in 2005, and he joined in 2009. So we'd had kids. Um, and in 2008, the gaming restrictions mm -hmm. happened. And so then he decided, and the recession hit. So now we've got two kids. Oh, especially in kids. California. Yeah, it went upside down. Yeah, it was crazy. So we ended up moving in with his parents, and we're like, we've got a year to figure this out, and then we've got to have something going. And um, because we've got two kids, we can't be, you know, in his parents' house. So we were just scrambling trying to figure it out. But the thing was, he had a college degree, but he'd had no work experience in it. So he was underqualified for every job with his degree. What did he uh, graduate with a degree in? A business degree. So okay. it was a very general degree. And then he, um, uh, any other job that, you know, what didn't require a degree, well, if he had a degree, then he was overqualified for it. So it was just this constant circular thing of him 
not being able to get a job that paid well enough and had benefits that would cover me and the kids. So, and, um, so then it was like, well, I can go back to work me and you can stay home with the kids or we could, um, but I had the same problem. I hadn't worked with my degree either yeah. and nobody was really hiring so at that, that gap point. In experience. Yeah. So he just went, well, I've always wanted to do seals or green berets. How about I join the army? And I was like, if that sounds like fun for you, like go get signed up, have a good time. Like we've got to fix this. So, okay. That's yeah. That's an interesting way that conversation. Could go. <laughs> yeah. I was like, if that's, if the, well, at that point we're both at home all the time with yeah. two little kids, one kid's on the autism spectrum and it's two hour tantrums, 10 times a day it's pretty miserable and we both were just like burned out and we're in his parents house so it was like if this is going to bring some relief Mm -hmm. and bring us some income and it'll make you happy because you're the one who has to be out there working then do that had he talked about the desire to go into special operations much um before that oh yeah because it's i mean yeah it doesn't sound like he walked by a recruiting office one day and saw a poster and was like that's it for me. <laughs> no. Um, growing up, because he was military, I remember him telling me stories of when they were in Germany as a kid. And um, his mom was busy working. His dad was out of country. And he literally would take his friends around while his mom was gone. And they'd do their own operations. And he would be the team lead. So he'd put together <laughs> teams. And they'd, they'd run these operations. And they were always getting into trouble. But You um, said his dad was a Marine Corps officer, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, I was going to say, that sounds... Exactly like a Marine Corps officer's son. Yeah. So he said, you know, from the time he was about 10, he was going to be a SEAL and he was running all of his buddies. You know, he was always the boss of the teams and, and telling yeah. everybody what to do. So, yeah, I wasn't surprised when he said, I want to go and, and try to become, you know, some sort of special operator. So I'm going to look at, at the Navy and look at the Army and see what, see what they offer and see what will be the best deal for us. So I was like, did okay. you have any concerns when he would voice that? I mean. Yeah, 2008, 2009, you know, seven, eight years past 9-11, pretty mature theater of war in Afghanistan, pretty mature theater of war in Iraq. Did it give you any cause for concern when he brought that up, knowing the environment he might be going into? Not necessarily. When I looked at it, and he and I discussed this a lot, it, it was a numbers thing. And because he was big on statistics, big on numbers, having played chess and poker forever, it was a matter of, well you know, you're just as likely to die in war as you are from cancer or a car wreck, you know? So he's like, really, he goes, I can go over there, but the odds of me dying, you know, but then we always used to joke, but you do have really bad luck because he did, yeah. um, which is ironic now, but, you know, so, but it wasn't really a concern. Um, and I don't know if it was our faith or whatever, but we always just feel, felt like, you know, it'll work out how it's supposed to. So, yeah. and if this, this sounds good, Let's do it. So so how did he settle on the Army versus the Navy? I have my own thoughts on that, yeah. obviously. I honestly don't really <laughs> remember. I think for him, it was just looking at, like, who's offering me what deal. Yeah, and that's like, fair. You know, I think when it came right down to it, Army just seemed like the right fit. So he did that. Yeah. And obviously, you guys did not go with him to boot camp. That would be an interesting experience in and of itself. <laughs> Army boot camp, I'm trying to think here, probably somewhere between eight to 12 weeks long, something along those lines. Yep. When were you able to reconnect with him? Because obviously the military, for the military member, that initial pipeline can be a little bit jarring. It's intentionally designed to detach you from everything else in your life. But at some point, you guys obviously came back together. Yeah, um, that was actually an interesting time period, which I don't really go over in the book. The kids and I moved in with my parents just because I knew then, you know, after he was in, we'd be traveling. So Mm -hmm. he left and I want to say it was September when he left um, and he went to boot camp um, and then did his training for MOS, for his MOS, which was in... um, That was in Texas because he was a 68 whiskey medic. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening is he got stuck there because somehow they kept misplacing his paperwork. So then he got stuck in Texas for a long time. So he left in September. We stayed with my parents and my dad ended up passing away in February. So then he came out and that was the first time I saw him since then. That's a substantial period of time. Yeah. So I think what he did was they 
they were messing things up. So he ended up going straight from Missouri at basic to Texas, like instantly. So unless I went back and visited him, but I had two little kids at that time. Yeah. I had, um, I think Isaac at that time was barely a year old and Zeke was insane and autistic and just, there was no way I could travel with them alone. And he was, I want to say two, two and a half. Yeah. So it was like, this isn't going to work unless the army gives you time to come visit before you go to Texas. And they, they wouldn't. So he just went straight to Texas, started there. Um, they gave him two days leave to come out to, um, California in February for my dad's funeral and then flew him back out. And then I didn't see him again until I want to say, gosh, it must've been, he got orders in April and then, um, I drove, Oh, no, it was after that. It was June. It was the end of June. He got eight orders, and I drove up and met him up here or in Washington State on our um, anniversary, July 23rd. His dad helped me pack up, and we drove up there. So you saw um, him for a few days in the span of about a year. Yeah, and then we drove out to um, Colorado where we were stationed, and I met him there. And It's an interesting dynamic military relationships it's very hard to describe the God, what would be the, I, I struggle to find the words to describe some of the the challenges of uh young kids mm -hmm. relatively newly married and hey i'll, I'll be back in a year yeah. <laughs> yeah there's some challenges that come with that yeah for sure um well and and the fact that they tell you you know it'll be six months don't worry and then the paperwork gets Who messed up and, recruiters? and you know yeah like that's what they're saying oh well it'll be basic <laughs> and then it'll be the mos training and then you know whatever and you'll be good and you'll see him in about you know in, in you know the spring at the latest and the next thing we know well they lost his paperwork and then they messed his name up you know with switched it with somebody else and now yeah. they're giving him special um, requests so he can actually go wherever he wants so we want to be stationed in washington and then they're like oh we messed you up with the other person that we messed you up with before so now they're going to watch Washington and you're going to Colorado. So you got their pick and they got your pick, but we can't fix it now. So have fun in Colorado. The a system year later. that you are describing could only be the military <laughs> Yeah, from somebody who lived through it. Yeah. It's, um, you ever heard him say, you know, if enough monkeys sit down at a typewriter, eventually they'll come out with a Shakespeare work of art. <laughs> if you give them enough time and enough typewriters. Yeah. Sometimes I would think that those monkeys were the ones behind the scenes in the U S military, just typing away. No yeah. Shakespeare though. At all. Maybe no. like the was the only word that they were stringing together. <laughs> yeah, I think God, so. That sounds horrendous. So did he join with a special forces contract? No, he just went in initially. And it, we we were so just at that point ready to move forward with our own lives and, and for him to have a job that he went in just as, um, as that, as a medic. And then once he got in, I think within a year he was bored. And he's yeah. like, I can't do this. He was already starting to, to try um, setting up side businesses. And then when he would like go on training or whatever, he'd want me to take over that side business. And I was like, I'm trying to raise two <laughs> like, I Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, no, I'm not going to. Well, you can just, you know, mail these things. Anyway, so you can imagine. I was like, no, you need to find more to do um, in general with your career or something. Well, so, what did they have him doing when he was stationed in Colorado? They were basically just waiting around to deploy, and besides that, doing training, it was just a big, um, like, cache that he was at. Yeah. So, combat support hospitals, so basically, they were just waiting to deploy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so probably day-to-day, -day he was doing hospital, either administrative or medical duties. I could see how that could... Well, especially if you wanted to come in and go to the special operations pipeline, that's going to wear thin pretty fast. Yeah, and and he always had some needed to have something going. I mean, even once he was, you know, in SF, it was constantly uh, something new. He was learning n new languages. Yeah. He was, you know, learning to do woodworking and you know, and all the stuff that goes with that. Like, oh, how do you sharpen tools? So he'd read a book on tool sharpening, and then he'd be working on that for hours. And then he liked coffee. So then it was like, well, in the morning, I also want to learn how to, you know, roast my own coffee beans. So in the morning, he'd be roasting his own coffee beans. And at night, he'd be sharpening his tools. I mean, it was just like he couldn't sit still. He had too much energy. So he'd be up at four in the morning, and, you know, he'd be up after I went to bed at like midnight. 
and that was that was him so yeah as you can imagine just a regular you know cash yeah. he, he was bored out of his mind so within the first year he goes i i want to go to sfas what do you think and I was like, yes, please, like, take that energy <laughs> and get crazy. going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to deal with your kids who have your, mu- you know, your same amount of energy. And, uh, like, yeah it, yeah, it was a lot to balance. So, Did he have a hard time getting into the pipeline or was it pretty straightforward? Um, it was really straightforward. He, uh, what was nice was his um, combat support hospital was really supportive, really excited. So he basically went straight to SFAS and was selected. And um, came home from that, and then it took about a year or so for him to get placed and sent off to um, the Q course. The Q course, yeah, if that, because I don't think we were even in Colorado for two years. Okay, yeah. It, so the SF, SFAS is kind of their pre-screening, right? They select the candidates that they're going to put on into the or follow on the long Q course, correct? Right. So yeah. you go in there and you have to do, and that's the other thing. Right there is where they do. Um, like they run a series of tests, so of course intelligence tests, and you have to you have to it raises your ASVAB up. You have to show that you can hit a certain score, and then they figure out personality tests, psychological tests, so where to place you as far as jobs and languages, and all of that is assigned. And then you do you know like the log carries and all that junk and the yeah. heavy ruck. So so it's all of that um, um, before you even go. They're kind of just trying to refine the product before they even start the pipeline. Right. So you you don't not everyone gets selected when they go through. SFAS. It's just their general selection for the training. That makes sense. And so, it's a good yeah. idea, too. Where did you guys move to once he began the Q course? So all the Q courses held at Fort Bragg. And yep. so we moved to um, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, and so, It's a lovely location. Yeah, it was I've a trip. been there so many times, <laughs> and I'll be honest, I'd pay money to not go back. Love everybody in Fayetteville, but yeah, yeah. hard pass. Yeah, that's always my thing. I'm like, a lot of great people, not a lot of great places to live. Yeah. Fort Bragg so, is an interesting place. Yeah, yeah, it is. I would imagine you didn't see him much during the Q course. I didn't. Um, he was in and out, and um, he was you know, selected as a medic, and he was selected for... Um, Arabic. So um, you add the Q course training onto the language and the medical and the medical and took a lot longer. Um, the 18 Delta course? Yeah. So that was extensive. And then he had to do hospital um, rounds. So he went and worked, you know, I think for a month up in, uh, I want to say Richmond, Virginia, out of an ER. Mm-hmm. And then he worked up, I want to say Oklahoma at a Cherokee base. Um, so they had to learn everything from how to deliver babies how to handle gunshot wounds to how to take care of animals so veterinarian care so that 18 delta course is unbelievable i mean what you described that's exactly what it is i mean their their sweet spot is everything from bedside manner to we're in the middle of nowhere and i'm gonna open this book and we're gonna do surgery <laughs> yep and he did that in in africa several times when uh how did he land on medic you know he, with the business degree there, I mean, there's so many different MOS MOSs in the army, and for people listening, that just stands. What is it? Military occupational specialty. I believe so. What another term for that would be? What is your job title, or what tranche of of the military world you work in? How did he land on that? Um, literally, when he went into SFAS, well. I don't know. He, he It interested him when he first went in. He mm-hmm. was like, I'd like to be a medic. I'd like to, you know, do all this stuff. And so they ended up, you know, having him do the 68 whiskey when he first went in regular. That's a different type of medic. They're but, not doing the ER stuff. They're not doing the Cherokee right. base. They're not. I mean, that's that's I would almost associate that. And I don't say this negatively with somebody working at a hospital mm-hmm. versus what you're talking about is basically a, a traveling doctor slash surgeon at the end of that Delta course. Right. And so I think what that has to do, how they come to that conclusion, because that's designated by the end of SFAS. So when they're at selection and they run that series of psychological tests and, you know, personality and and, aptitude. Yeah. All of that. That's when they come up with, okay, the, this would be the best fit for this person. And with his background as a 68 whiskey at that point, they were like, well, it's probably a good fit. So that's, he got assigned it, honestly. Was it what he thought it was going to be? He loved it. Every second of it. In fact, once he got in, he was like, if I get out of the military, I want to see if I can 
you know, get my doctorate and start working in ERs because he loved the fast pace, the intensity. He was, that was his wheelhouse. He loved anything where everything was going crazy and everyone was panicking because he was so calm and yeah. he just enjoyed that. I don't know if they do it anymore, but for the SEAL corpsmen, they used to send them to the 18 Delta course as well, both the short course, the six month, and then the longer, which I think might be. 12 or 18 months, but they can have the ability to prescribe meds at the end of the long one. And those guys described the training, specifically the rotations through the hospitals as some of the best training that they had ever received. They'd go from doing exactly what you said. I am doing a rotation in the the wing where they deliver babies. And then the next one, I'm literally riding in the back of the hot in the ambulance plug in holes as we go along. So it's a, uh, it's a really it's an impressive program that I don't think gets enough uh, notoriety for what it is that they do. Yeah, a lot of people don't even know who they are. So they would be in the hospitals yeah. working alongside um, new doctors coming in. So, so you know, these, these kids just fresh out of college who are now doing their residencies are working there alongside them and don't even know who they are. Yeah, they, They're like, who are these <laughs> military guys basically in here working with us? And I don't even know if it was something they discussed or were, were allowed to talk. I, I don't know. Brian just said none of us, none of them knew who we were and we just thought it was funny to leave it at that, to not tell them who we were. I would have probably done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just very enjoyable. Leave it unsaid. (laughs) Leave a question mark at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, but they do still train the Navy corpsmen alongside them last when Brian was in. So I'm assuming that's still going. Well, I don't know why the Navy would want to create their own system. I mean, that, that course there is from everything that, you know, the live tissue training that they do it, it, you get people who come out of that. And if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're leaking hydraulic fluid, those are the people that you want to have your hands on or reverse that. Those are the people you want to have their hands on you. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. They were very good. And uh, in the community I came from, oftentimes people would be pissed that Mm -hmm. they had to take time out of the pipeline because you'd go to Bud's and if you were a corpsman, you would detach and go down the pipeline. You would start going down that more advanced because how can I put this? A Navy corpsman sounds a lot like what your husband was doing in Colorado. And I have nothing but respect and love for everybody who serves in the military, but battlefield medicine and hospital medicine are different things. I suppose there could be some overlap in what you find in the emergency room, but for the SEAL candidates, if you're not going to be a corpsman, you leave. And when I went through, you went you went and checked into your team after going to uh, Static Line Jump School. The corpsman left the pipeline for six months, maybe if they were lucky and their class was just getting ready to start a year, if it wasn't. So they had this feeling that they were going to miss out on something. And then they come back and they're just absolute rock stars. Like, you son of a bitch. You made the right call. So yeah. short-term pain, long-term victory, for sure. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, like I said, those, those, those people were... Fantastic. So he goes to the Q course, um, and then the medical training is after. They sent him to 18 Delta after the Q course? It was mixed in there, but it, it, everybody, what they do is they do the Q course. So, you know, there's there's multiple, as far as the Q course goes, there's there's multiple, like, sections yeah. of it that you have to pass, like Jade Helm and – or not Jade Helm. Jeez, what am I saying? Um, anyway, Robin Sage. Robin Sage, Sear School, all of yeah. that. So um, – they do all that, and then they change up when you go to your MOS training. So some of them do it right away. Some of them do it after. But the thing is, each each MOS has a different length of training. And I believe most of them, I think they're like two or three months. And yeah. then the medical end, I think they're closer to six months. Um, and then the language training, you have to do your language training as well. So And, and they change that around as well. And each one gets designated a language. So French, um, yeah. You know, whatever. So, where do they do the language training? They do that there. In Bragg? Um, yeah, they actually bring in um, people from all over to do the language training. Is that just a full immersion course for them while they're doing that? It's that's their nine to five job is to go sit and learn a language and only that. Yeah, I believe so. <sighs> and what, probably six months? It might not even be that long. I feel I, like that's not long enough to learn Arabic. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I don't think they have that long. I'm thinking three months. That's definitely not long enough to learn Arabic. Yeah. 
But it depends on on the person too, right? Because some guys are super just that's true hardcore, that's and true. then other people are like you know laid back. So like Brian's style was he had the tapes playing in his car, and so at lunch he'd eat lunch, he'd pack lunch, bring you know sit in his car, listen to the tapes in his car, and then at night he'd come home and he'd turn it on up in the office and just be up there speaking Arabic, and then he'd bought his own Arabic books. He bought a Quran. He was just that was Brian. He was fully immersed himself again that's more common than probably people would think that that to me what you're describing somebody that level of commitment is again the vast majority of people that i was very fortunate to be surrounded by uh, in the community that i came from doesn't surprise me at all yeah when did they in that pipeline when do they let you know where you're going to end up as your final command once you get your green beret and you because i know he ended up it was an east coast oda correct Yes, we were. Um, we got. To, gosh, it seems like that was kind of last minute. Like yeah. we we thought that doesn't surprise me either. <clears throat> no, and and you put in you request where you're going to go, and honestly, we we. I mean, come on, it's it's a yeah, it's a joke. They you know, they're going to send you where they're going to send you, and honestly, that decision's pretty much made up the day your language is assigned. Yes, it's called the so. needs of the military. They call it the dream sheet in bugs yeah. when I went through in in second phase, in diving. They're like, gentlemen. The odds of you successfully graduating are very high at this point, unless you do something stupid. And we want you to put down your dream command that you'd like to go to. We'll go one, two, and three. And I was from the West Coast, so I thought uh, the even number teams are on the East Coast. It's like two, four, and eight. I got team five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, which is in San Diego, it, which oh. was awesome. But San Diego and Virginia Beach are pretty much the two choices. But that was another eye opener of. So you call this a dream sheet, right? Okay. Because then I would canvas some of my buddies like, hey, what'd you put down? And the East Coast guys almost all put down West Coast teams. And the people who got assigned West Coast almost all put down East Coast teams. Like, okay. So you <laughs> call it a dream sheet, huh? I'm pretty sure those got filed in the garbage can. <laughs> yeah. They're here to crush your dreams. <laughs> or they're there to make you feel like you have some level of control over your path. But the reality is you're a little bit like a flag blown in the wind. Yeah. And the military is the fan that points the direction that that wind is going to go. Yeah, that's very true. So we we pretty much were hoping for Washington State once again because that's where you know our family's all West Coast. So and there's only groups and you know like yep. like like um like the seals. There's only groups certain places, and so then we were told Kentucky, and we pretty much believed Kentucky until three weeks before graduation, and then it was like no. Fayetteville, your 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 Fayetteville, so we weren't going anywhere. Um, so we found out pretty mu- pretty much last minute that keep our house, we're staying here, and that's yeah. that. Um, but as far as assigned to um, an actual team, that's a whole nother thing because a lot of times teams um, that already exist, they look around at who the new graduates are and if they have an empty slot, and they basically recruit who they want to their team. Almost like a so, draft. <clears throat> yeah. So Brian um, first came out, just graduated, and he automatically got deployed. Like, I'm thinking, let's see, he graduated – and then went almost straight within the month to um, Afghanistan on a B team. And they were only there for um, another three months. So he mm-hmm. went there at the end of their deployment and worked with a B team. He had a great time, but he wasn't really outside the wire much other than to just do little um, fun day trips type thing. It's, it, it was nothing combat related. The B teams are related. more of a support role, right? Right. They tend to run communications. Yeah. and, and yeah. I, I'm getting to the the limit of, I mean, obviously ODA operational detachment alphas are the A team. Yes, because it's alpha, but I don't want to take away from calling the beat. Like, you know I mean? It's not a rack and stack. It's just the organizational template. So that the A team or the alphas, those are the ones that I would interface with the most, but they always had that robust support behind them. And that would be mm-hmm. the the B team, right? Right. And I a think lot it's times, easy for people like, oh, you're on the B team. It's like, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, and a lot of guys who are on the B team are rotating through A yeah. teams or they're they're going to train for a new job. So they go back to the B team there and they're a huge asset and then yeah. and then they rotate out. So that's what really happens a lot is they're working with majors and, you know, so they're they're kind of it's kind of the command. And you then, get a lot of exposure and you get a lot of understanding of the mechanism of the military and how things actually work. And then when you rotate back into that operational element. That knowledge is actually, it can really be key. It can either help you work your way through bottlenecks or it can actually help you really avoid 
problems working through the bureaucracy. So I think it's a great system. There's yeah. nothing really like that in the SEAL community. We have um, support personnel, but they don't necess- they don't rotate into the operational elements because all of the operational elements are SEALs themselves, not necessarily the support personnel. We'll take oh, okay. enablers on target sometimes, but other than that, most of the support personnel don't leave the wire. Oh, okay. And if they wanted to, they would have to go through buds, through all the, you know what I mean? It's not, it's that support personnel is not populated by people who are doing that rotation. Hmm. So it's a different model, pros and cons to both, I think. Yeah, I think so. How did you guys, so at this point he had been in for probably close to three years. Mm -hmm. How are you guys managing your relationship with just the extended periods of time being gone, probably limited communication? You know, it's interesting because I think we were both always such uh, self-sufficient people um, that, I mean, I was older when we got married. I was 27 and I always was kind of just doing my own thing. How old was he? Um, He was 21. So, um, or maybe 22 when we got married. He was about five years younger than me. Um, But he had actually graduated high school and gotten his AA simultaneously and then graduated college two years later. So he got his degree at the same time I got my degree. Just a true underachiever. Right, right. (laughs) So, um, yeah, so I'd been kind of just doing my own thing for years. I did college and then was just doing the ski bum thing when we met. So I think it was more like I always say, you know, we didn't need each other, but we wanted each other. And so that made things better. And so um, it just it was so much more of a compliment. And so we always wanted to be together, but we couldn't always be together. And so we just made it work and we were we were best friends and um he was glad not to be with the kids when when the older one was freaking out and having meltdowns and i was all about that so i was good so it just it worked out really well he was doing his job i was doing my job and then when he was home we just have fun and you know so it, it never really caused any issues yeah how did he deal with being away from his kids for those extended periods of time. That was hard for him, for sure. Um, and, you know, and I think all military men deal with this. When you come back in, you have the challenge of reestablishing yourself in the parent role, but you can't just, you know, roll back in and yeah. start commanding the kids. So that that was always, it always was a little bit of a um, tumultuous time as far as me having to remind him, like, you can't step back in as the punisher. You need to come back in as just, like, friendly dad initially and then, once they've um, grown back into that um, comfort zone with you and trusting you, then you can start doing, you know, the punishing and, and all of that and, and really play a parent role because, you know, th- that was important to, to maintain his relationship with his kids above all else, even if that put more um, pressure on me. Yeah, it was challenging for me. When I got out, my children were relatively young. Um, I mean, the last deployment I did was in 2010. I remember kissing my daughter goodbye in a crib. So oh, wow. she, I mean, no memory of any military deployments. My oldest sons at the time, so were probably eight and seven. I remember they, I was trying to get out of the house before they woke up, and they actually woke up and came downstairs, which whew, made it substantially harder to go and say goodbye. I think I made a, a quarter of a block before I couldn't see through the tears and was just on the side of the road bawling my eyes out. Um, it would be, it was always tough coming back because all you wanted to do is wrap your arms around them and just Mm -hmm. be involved in everything that they're doing. But you realize they also had to learn how to live their life without you there as well. And so it was almost like merging traffic. Yeah. I would describe it. Some people can merge. They understand the zipper concept. Other people suck at driving and can't figure out that you can <laughs> let one car in in front of you and then, then you're the next car, Yeah, which would be the people who come home and are like over the top, overbearing. But it was uh, – the reason I asked is I struggled with it myself. Yeah, and my children were younger, but you'd get home and you'd sit there and you'd realize like, yeah, they missed you, but their life also went on as well. Yeah. It was tough. It was challenging. I'm glad that he – and you, that both of you were able to, to figure out a way to navigate that. Not, not all, not many, I would say, if you look at the mm-hmm. divorce rate in the military, have that much success with it. Yeah. What we usually tried to do when he would come back, um, that also would help, 
is you know there's usually like about a month span where they give you guys some downtime so we would plan something like one time we went to disney world another time we went up to dc another time we went down to the caribbean and just went on a cruise and that way everybody has kind of that time away from home away from regular life to kind of recalibrate yeah and that did help um that's a good idea but, all of yeah. that sounds great except for disney world yeah that's it's intense <laughs> Did they have it on the sign there, like the happiest place on earth? Because I want to rip that sign down and burn it. The kids might have been having fun. I hate that place. Or, which one's in LA? Disneyland is in yeah, the LA, LA area. Yeah. Yeah. Happiest place on earth. My ass. I haven't been to Disneyland in years. <laughs> Don't go. Yeah. There's nothing for you to see there. I did go to Disney World recently, and it was chaos, but I didn't really plan on hitting up all the rides and doing all the stuff. I was just like, there to like ride the gondola, yeah. Go to the water park. So Have I had a, a great time. Dollar hot dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that part. That was the only thing that I was like, oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but you'd think the um, best move there would be to just to pack a lunch, and then it's clearly states at their entryway. No food can be brought in. I'm like, hmm. I wonder why. Yeah. I'd like a bottle of water for thirteen dollars. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's really insane. Supply chain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is, right? Can't get any trucks in there, so it's triple. Yeah, yeah, indeed. All right. So what happened after the that first B team rotation? What did his career look like after that? So right after he got back, he packed and left for uh Ranger School, which um, as you know, I mean it's a great career opportunity, but he loses his phone and is just basically gone for three months. Uh, pretty much radio silence and he got sent so fast that I had no information so I ended up having him contact me like panicked one day a month out that he was hungry and he had a list of food for me and um, (laughs) that they were having family day and that there was a website I needed to go to to get on on Facebook to follow so that I would know next time not to miss family day and bring him food. So I guess they were starving and working Ranger in the school woods. school involves some starving. I have never yeah. gone through. If I'm being totally honest, when I first got into the SEAL teams, when you got a DUI, you would go to Ranger School as punishment because it sucks. It's extremely physically difficult. And it's a leadership course. It's what it's designed around. But it's hard. Very, very hard. So it doesn't surprise me he was a little hungry. Yeah. He told me they would give him <laughs> one meal a day and they had like a time a timed like I think two minutes to yeah. eat it as much as they could and then that was all the food they'd get for the next 24 hours 20 so, 30 40 pounds of weight loss is not uncommon yeah so he said they were packing and and then it's what it's mountains swamp mm-hmm. they go to three different terrains. I think jungle maybe the or actually the yeah. jungle might be i think it's encapsulated on, in the swamp might be desert Maybe so. I I think one, I know one is at Benning. Mm -hmm. So it's, and that might be kind of the jungle portion. Yeah. And then I think the mountains, they actually take them up to maybe some mountains in Georgia and then some swamps in Florida. I'm very uh, unfamiliar with that actual pipeline. Okay. So yeah, but so he's, it's a month in each place. And then, and it's like, if you don't, you know, you might have to recycle one portion and most people recycle. He got through without recycling. Thank goodness. Um, He came out though. And yeah, you could, it was, you know, he had lists and lists and lists of ride in the rain um, food that he needed. So um, it was interesting, but he did it. He was super proud. He graduated April 1st, 2016, I want to say. And then he went straight to deployment in Niger the next, um, I want to say maybe a month later, he left in May. Um, the, so with his ODA this time? Or they a- recruited him onto ODA 3212. Okay. And so um, left with uh, the first deployment to Marathi, Niger, and they were there for six months, came home for a few months, and then left in 2017 for the final um, for the final uh, one out of Wallam, Niger, where they were ambushed. How was that first deployment that he went on? What was What were his feelings like going over for his first time being attached to an ODA? I think everything was happening so fast. We were excited, but it just was chaos because, I mean, it was, you know, the, the way it happened where he graduated, um, graduated the course, went straight to Afghanistan, came home and went straight to to um, ranger school, came home from ranger school and a month later leaves. So it was just it was 
like rushed because we had to get all the gear, get it all lined out and he had to get all the training done. So even Mm -hmm. getting the pre-deployment training done, he's just scrambling. He was hardly home. So did he um, feel prepared? Did he feel like he got it all done? He did. Yeah. Um, And by the time he got, you know, on the flight, it just was like, okay, see you later. You know, like you, you didn't have time for nerves. You didn't have time to really even discuss it. He was just gone. And then because um, we were so ill prepared, he got over there and he didn't have a phone that worked. Um, he liked to have his cheap, you know, flip phone type things. He was very frugal, <laughs> frugal. Yep. and so um, nothing worked in Africa. So like a month later, I got a phone call and it was actually from David Johnson's phone. He borrowed his phone and said, yeah, um, my phone doesn't work over here, so I'll call you when I can, um, borrowing people's phones, so it might be from random numbers. <laughs> so, yeah, the first time he calls me from David Johnson's phone, and so I'd be calling back, and it would be, you know, David or somebody else would pick up, and I'd be like, hi, this is, you know, Brian Black's wife, and they'd be like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, and pass me off or, or leave a message for him. Yeah, I would have care packaged him a phone if I were you. at that point i was like whatever yeah he'll be home and we'll fix it next time so leading up when he got back from that first deployment are we at about four years in the military at this point no we've been in it had been a long time total he did seven years okay so Um, he was in probably about six years then yeah how much of that time do you think he spent at home with you and his kids gosh not much um I'd say a lot more when we were in Colorado. He was home yeah. most of the time. Um, as far as the Q course, I would say... That was probably the beginning of the infrequent times at home. Yeah. So we saw maybe him for three to five months that when he was doing the Q course stuff a year. Yeah. And then um, and that went on for, I want to say the Q course lasted three to four years just because he had an injury at one point. And then once he started deploying, we saw him maybe three months a year. But if if we say we saw him three months a year, he was also training, yeah. doing a lot of training. So he'd be gone for a couple of weeks, a month. So really maybe two months a year. Yeah. When he came back from that first deployment to Niger, how was he feeling about his career choice? Was he happy with what he had chosen? Did he feel like the mission that they were doing over there? Was it what he wanted it to be? Was he fulfilled by it? There were several things. He loved the mission. He loved the job, but he hated the bureaucracy. He was tired of feeling like when they needed things, I mean, even basic things like their Toyota Hiluxes didn't move in the sand. They couldn't take more than, I think, three people on them without them getting stuck. Um, So the engines didn't work. Um, They just weren't big enough. And so, I mean, basic things that... So if Niger is the, you know, one of the poorest countries in the world and they have better trucks for their military on the ground that can carry, you know, like 30 guys at a time, why is it that American vehicles can only carry, you know, two or three guys at a time and not all of their equipment? Um, so Brian was getting frustrated because he goes, there's all these issues and we are putting in every single year. He goes, we're putting in requests. He goes, and when I look back, these requests have been going on for years and years and years and we're being ignored and they're wanting us to do riskier and riskier missions. And, you know, there's just not the assets and we don't, I mean, we don't really have, because we're capable of doing these things, but Mm -hmm. we're so poorly equipped. And every time we, we put in complaints about anything, we're basically ignored. Yeah, there's a very fine line between being capable of doing a mission and being really far outside an acceptable risk profile. Because if everything goes right, sure, we can do this all day long. But if you start having compounding failures, Maybe it's just even in communication or you don't have ISR or the weather and then you don't have medevac or Kazavac. Yeah, you're still capable of doing it, but you shouldn't be doing it because the risk far outweighs what that small element may be able to do. That, that, that matrix just gets – it gets out of whack really, really fast. Yeah, and that's a big thing that really concerned him because being the medic before the last time he deployed, he actually told me, he goes, I'm going to go and brief some of my commanders because I've looked at what they say the Kazavak times are over there. And looking at the actual assets in country and flight times, he goes, they're telling us that it's two to three hours and it's closer to six. Yeah. He goes, and and that's, that's a big discrepancy. It's also a really long time to try to keep somebody alive. 
Yeah. Um, you know, over in Afghanistan and Iraq, they constantly told us about the golden hour. Get them on the helicopter, get them in a vehicle, and get them to a higher level of medical care within an hour. And likely, especially if they have one of those people that's, you know, just hands on and giving them amazing battlefield medical treatment. And I've seen some unbelievable things with blood transfusions to like stuff, people doing stuff. I'm like, I feel like you need to be in an operating suite to be doing this, but it's keeping people alive. Mm-hmm. But they were also transporting them to an extremely high level of care facility within that 60 minute time period. And to be honest, most of the time it was like 30 minutes. It was fast because we had assets all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, m- mind you, on those deployments, I was I was at a command that had a lot of uh, assets, mm-hmm. uh, different than the, it sounds like the ODA structure was working in Africa, but it made all the difference in the world. And it allows mm-hmm. you to tolerate risk at a higher level because you can stack things in the background. So in case something happens, it's an immediate action. Hmm. Without that, again, the risk to reward matrix becomes very askew very quickly. Yeah. And and that's what they were dealing with is is it just Yeah. No, there there wasn't much there for yeah. them to depend on. And on top of it, I think what they did have, the assets they did have, were contracted. So they knew that if if there was a firefight going on, these contracted birds are not going to come in and, and help us because they won't they won't do anything while the bullets are flying. Yeah, that's that's a problem because on paper, you could say we have assets, but if the assets are only willing to fly when it's bluebird skies and not raining lead, then you might have a problem on the ground. Right. Yeah, it's that's how you can look good on paper and put yourself into a substantial uh, area of risk on the ground. Yep. And that's that's that was Africa when they were there. Yeah. Um, So he had done one deployment there. He kind of probably had an idea of the reality on the ground at that point. Like you said, he was briefing some of the people in his chain of command. This is what I saw. These are the realities. Uh, How did he feel about training up to go back? Um, he knew the area they were going into was higher risk because they had assessed the area they were in before, which was more southern Niger. And while it was along the border of Nigeria, which is is also a little bit more of a hotbed than, um, uh, well, it just was a little bit of a hotbed, but it wasn't as bad as the border with Mali. Um, so they actually didn't have much going on besides like catching cattle thieves while they were down in Marathi. Mm-hmm. Um, so they actually picked up and moved the post up to um, the outpost moved up to Wallam, which is quite a bit further north um, near the Mali border. And they knew that that's that's a much heavier um, a lot of a lot of militant activity was going on there. At that time, what I didn't know until I started researching for my book was that there had been multiple attacks going on in the year prior and even the six months prior to the ambush Mm -hmm. that were increasing in severity and um, getting closer and closer to the area my husband was working in. And every time they would attack, they would attack Nigerian um, soldiers and they would um, steal all of their equipment. And so... Um, it, it was getting worse and it should have been concerning, at least to those who were handling, um, intelligence and, uh, you know, watching the groups and sending them out on missions in that area. As your husband was prepping for that second deployment to that Northern location before he deployed, did he have any idea of that, that increased, um, it sounds like they were marching their uh, footprint a little bit more into Niger. Did, did they know of that or did they think that the situation was largely the same? I mean, in hindsight, I think they did, but I don't think Brian would admit it to me. So he, he stayed with the whole thing of, you know, safest place to go. I'm more likely to die of a car wreck, blah, 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 which I guess mm-hmm. statistics as a whole in the military, you you could keep saying that. But um, and, and Niger was overall pretty quiet. And, and really, their biggest loss of life was usually due to car wrecks. Um, which ironic, they needed better cars, right? Yeah. Um, so, but that was the general thought was like, unless he gets in a car wreck, he'll, he'll probably be fine. But I think he was very aware of the growing threat. And as long as they stayed within what what they were supposed to be doing, which was training, yeah. um, so by, with, and through missions, um, that would have been a relatively safe um, 
safe mission set and safe deployment for him. The problem was that that's not what happened. They went outside their mission set, and um, I believe the officers involved had a very cavalier attitude towards the real, very real threat the enemy posed up near the border. And um, so the men, when they, on my husband's team, began to say we shouldn't be up on, on missions like this, they were discounted. Yeah, that was one of the sections of the book where talking about the captain and his you know, being briefed on the fly, being extended in the field, voicing his concerns and being told, yeah, got it, but continue on. T- to me, having worked briefly in an operational capacity in my last uh, deployment to Afghanistan, I started off at a at a tactical element, and I was I basically was covering for a guy who was on uh, paternity leave. His wife was getting ready to give birth. Then I moved to the operations officer role, and I would augment both of the maneuver elements that we had over there. You can't second guess the people in the field. You have to, in my opinion, I don't know what it says in doctrine, but in my opinion, when you're on the receiving end of information from people on the ground saying the risk no longer justifies us being here. What you're asking us to do, we're not able to do. The only thing that you can say to them is, unless it's like some, unless Bin Laden is going for a stroll to the local chai shop, which spoiler alert, he's not going to. (laughs) um, The answer is, okay, you're going to make the call on the ground because I am not there and we'll figure out a better way to do this. That's the response. In my opinion, that's the responsible way to conduct those operations. And when you don't do that, you know, there's a reason that your book is sitting in between us. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. So how was everything leading up to that second deployment? Great. I mean, you know, same as usual. Um, we actually had a pretty good year, did some trips and um, yeah, and everything seemed pretty normal. But it was odd because this time as he left, I just I don't know, I just had a bad feeling. And I think he did, too, because it just... Did he verbalize it at all? No, that wasn't Brian. It was like, I'm fine. You know, everything will be good. Same thing. You know, the odds of anything happening, you know, we're good and we'll see you in six months. And I was like, all right, you know, but I mean... Did you verbalize it at all to him how you were feeling? I didn't. You know, it was one of those things where you get this bad feeling and you feel like if you verbalize it, then you actually make it happen. So I just was like, I'm going to just let it go. And, um, but I did call up my best friend as I left and just lost it. And I was like, I don't know. I feel totally freaked out right now. Um, this just doesn't feel right. And I never, I mean, I never worried. So that, that yeah. just was very strange to me. How was your communication with him once he, uh, sent out on that second deployment? Um, we were able to talk over the phone a couple times. Did um, he upgrade his tech to something other than a flip phone? <laughs> no. He got himself a te- an all tech. Something a little bit. It wasn't a flip phone, but, you know, it was wasn't an upgrade. Exactly not a flip phone. But, yeah, <laughs> depends on how you look at it. It was very affordable, and he was sure it might work better over there. He just had to get the right, you know. SIM card. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, God, okay. <laughs> yeah, and then he tells me at one point that it wasn't working, and he was going to go to Niami um, and get another one, and then, of course, that never happened. But, um, yeah, it, the communication was always an issue, but we could talk via um, WhatsApp. So we would do a lot of voice recordings that way and send them back and forth between him and the kids and – um, which is great because I, you know, I have those now, and yeah. then and then we'd send pictures back and forth and and talk via uh, WhatsApp all the time. So you at least had some level of connectivity. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I don't know where I land on that one. When I when I was still going overseas, it was Iridium satellite phones, which are the worst to talk on because of the delay, mm-hmm. or email, or uh, a satellite landline in a room full of other people. Mm -hmm. And I I saw two different versions of communication. One was my, my description would be over communicating like every day on the phone emails. And then though, if there was a gap in communication, it, it would really throw off the person on the other end and they would think that something was wrong. And maybe they, you know, maybe the person had to go do something and had to go somewhere for like get their teeth cleaned overseas, which still happens by the way. Mm-hmm. And then there's under communication where 
once every three months, it's an email like, hey, what's up? (laughs) (laughs) I think the balance is somewhere in between those two. Yeah. Um, And for me, I think the the last point was like, I call like once every two weeks because it gives you that flexibility of, hey, I might be out doing something. And I would email like, I'm going to be unavailable for a while. So I know I'm supposed to call in the next few days, but I'm not going to be able to. I think, I don't know. I didn't have the opportunity to over communicate, but I think- I think both are dangerous. I think I think you have to find that sweet spot. I would have liked yeah. to have had the ability to do voice, voice record, uh, recordings and some pictures. That would have been nice. Um, yeah, you have to balance that, though. Yeah, we, we were pretty much in the middle. Brian wasn't a big phone talker, so I knew, like, I'll hear from him maybe every other week or every yeah. few weeks. But that takes the pressure off a little bit. It does, you know, yeah. As opposed to how come I'm not hearing every day at 4.30 like we agreed upon. yeah. But what was weird is this time, because I'd already had a bad feeling, the minute, like when he said, you know, oh, I'll, I'll call you in a, a day or two, the minute I didn't hear from him, I actually kind of panicked because I just, it felt like something was off. Yeah. And how did it progress from there? Um. So, yeah, I think he talked to me, and I, I don't remember what night it was. I have it written in the book. It's like a Sunday or a Monday night. And they were getting ready to go on this thing, and I didn't hear from him for two days, and I knew it was just a one-day mission, and he said he was going to go to Niami after that and get a new SIM card and try out his phone. So I thought he should be up to Niami by now if they came back and then went up to Niami. But um, I don't know. It just I had a bad feeling, really bad feeling. And um, then I thought, well, I, me and his mom were really close. Um, I used to joke that I married him for his mom because she's awesome. But um, that's fair though. <laughs> yeah, I can support that. Yeah, exactly. At least we get along, right? <laughs> but if we hated each I was other, say it could certainly be the other side of that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but she's amazing. So, um, but I was avoiding talking to her just because of all. I was afraid that I'd talk to her and say something um, and scare her. So, um, but then she called me one night and just said, "Hey, did you see that news flash? I just had one come across my phone that a team was attacked up near the Mali Niger border." Um, it sounds like it was a, gr- a group of Green Berets, and some of them were killed. And I instantly said, that was Brian's team. Brian's dead. And then it's like it was out of my mouth before I could even, like, stop and myself. you had been contacted by anybody in the military? Yeah. And so then I panicked because I didn't mean for it to come out. And then yeah. she she's like, you can't, you know, we don't know that. And I thought I shouldn't be saying that to his mom. Um, and then a couple of hours later, um, I received a knock at the door. I pretty much just sat and waited for it because I knew. It is so the importance that has to be placed on notification of next of kin before things hit the news. I don't have the vocabulary for how important that is and the fact that you had heard about that on the news and had come to that conclusion and we're waiting for a knock on the door. I can't even imagine what that feels like. Um, in 2010, I had come back early. My mom had passed from cancer. I was able to spend a little bit of time with her before she passed. And there was a non-combat related helicopter crash that occurred. Um, so I was one of the few people, the they were doing turnover operations. So it'd be most of the unit getting ready to come in and rotate. And one person basically is the... Uh, to make sure that there was uh, continuity. And so everybody, you know, left seat, right seat stuff. One of the helicopters crashed and we pulled everybody into work that was back at the US, which is never a good sign in the first place. Like, hey, we need you to come in. I'm not going to tell you why. So guys, alarm bells are going off already. Well, somehow, and I'll leave the details out of it because I know exactly how this fucking happened. The word started to spread that somebody had been killed. And by the time that person ended up having to be notified via telephone call because it was getting out of control and the word was spreading and spreading and spreading. And apparently she was sitting in her car under an underpass, you know, in San Diego waiting for the call because she had talked to other people and they had already heard that it wasn't there. You know what I mean? Like that it's just to, oh to lose control of that information and to have somebody already come into that, you know what I mean? Like it's already going to be horrendous enough. That it, and I've watched it happen where people are in such a rush to make 
I don't, I don't even want to say a news story out of it, but they're in such a rush to spread the information where all of that shit needs to be stopped. And the first thing that needs to happen is that the next of kin has to be notified. So yeah. I am so incredibly sorry that it went that, that way for you because I saw the impact, not directly, but indirectly, I saw the impact that it had um, on that other family. And, and nobody should be asked to, to carry that because that's just, again, I don't have the vocabulary to describe how much that must have sucked. Yeah, it did. I mean, I basically, I'm, the only, I guess the only upside to it is I made sure my kids were asleep before they showed up. You know? <sighs> I mean, you are certainly a glass half full woman. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I never saw it that way. Holy shit. <laughs> but I mean, when you're thinking about it, you know, your kids, I mean, do you want your kids to be there when that happens? Because you don't know how you're going to react and you don't know how, the, and can you handle them while you're still reacting? And that was my full, like, Gotta One get, of the hardest parts in the book for me to read was how you made it through the entire next day, knowing that your husband with, was dead and that their father was dead without telling them. And I can't even imagine what it must have taken from you to put that face on, to get them to school, to pretend as if that that next morning was going to be normal. And I mean, I'm assuming people were flying to you as well, too. The families were coming together. I mean, I, nobody should have to bear that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think for kids, I, I couldn't imagine waking a kid up to that news. I just, yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that to them. And uh, being able to have their grandpa there, that was like, okay, yeah, you know, that that'll help. How was, uh, how was the actual notification? Did you hear him pull up to your house? Yeah, I was sitting on. I had these steps that go down to the front front door, so I just sat there and waited. And I heard the car pull up, heard the doors shut, so I knew. You know, I thought they're either going to come and tell me. Well, no, I, I didn't even consider that he was injured. I just figured he was he was dead. I just knew. Yeah. Um, how long did they stay with you? I honestly don't remember. Um, I went into pretty serious shock. All I remember is they asked me if I knew anyone. I called a friend. Um, I called my mother-in-law. Um, and she hadn't been notified yet. She was still waiting I'm and assuming she, they had a team en route for her. Yeah, but I didn't know how it worked, and she didn't know how it worked, so she just asked me to tell her, so I did. And then she contacted my father-in-law, who lived, um, he was up in D.C. at the time, so he was able to come down. Yeah. Um. So it was just, it was chaos. I, I don't really remember anything. I After that, I just sat in the front room drinking, you know, glass after glass of water. I probably drank, like, you know, five gallons that night and just stared at a wall trying to pull myself out of shock I, I don't know yeah and then how were the subsequent days after that um pretty surreal um it was it's just... amazing how many things they ask of you in that place all of these decisions that have to be made i know they uh, i'm pretty sure they called a keiko i know it was a cao for you right yeah i think it's a keiko in the navy casually assistance call officer something like that mm -hmm. so they assign somebody to you to help make those decisions, but holy shit, the number of things you have to think about in a in an emotional state where difficult is probably not the even a stretch of a word that defines it. Yeah, I mean, one thing that they did is they called me up while the kids were at school at school before they knew Brian was um, had been killed, and they wanted me to fly to Dover that day. By I think they called me at like eleven, and I needed to make my decision by. 12 that I would fly up to Dover for when the bodies came Receive home bodies, by yeah. one. And um, that's an impossible I, request. I was like, there's no way because by the time I got back home, the kids would be home and there would be all these people here and I'd have to explain that to them and they don't even know. And I can't go, it just to me, it was, it was like, this is impossible because they'll get home and I'll be flying in from receiving their dad's body and I'll be a mess. So I had to decide like what's best for them in the end. And yeah. so I didn't, no one showed up to Dover for Brian. How did you tell the kids? Uh, um, I took my father-in-law and the kids and uh, I don't know if I can say it, but we went out to a park and I told him. How old were they at the time? Nine and 11. <sighs> yeah. So. Um, I can't even imagine having to do that. 
No. But it was, you know, I tried to think of the best and kindest way to do it. And I, th I think I did that. I don't have any tissue in here. I failed. It's all right. I, I got my sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> I suck. I apologize. I should have some tissues I know tissues you make me here. cry and you didn't bring any tissues. I am not trying to make you cry. <laughs> I, I do not want anybody to cry. I'm a sympathetic crier. It's like, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So that's that's the one part that I usually can't. Yeah. Of all the things I can talk about, that one, you know, it's it's the kids. It's. I I you know I can't I can't imagine trying to find the location or the words to do that, but I also can't remember. I can't even fathom. Being a child and being on the receiving end of that, both of the both sides of that coin to me are so almost outside of my level of, of comprehension. Yeah, and and the reason I chose the place I chose is because I thought they can wrap this up as a bad memory and they won't even remember where it happened later because it's just this hidden park in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Yeah, and it, it'll just be this terrible nightmare that they'll never have to revisit. And this was probably within 24 hours of you being notified. It was the next day, right? Yeah. Probably after their school. What uh, What were the next few days like for you? Um, just chaos, you know, signing papers. And, uh, you know, half the time I didn't even – family was there, so I didn't know where the kids were. They were with family. And, yeah. I mean, there's so much you have to do. There's, you know, the the casualty affair uh, – CAO was there. Yeah. Um, and so he fortunately, I mean, they give you a massive book that's ridiculous, this binder. I mean, honestly, they should have like a file that they, they send to you via email that you just store because it's, it's way too much. You have to carry it around from place to place. And, and I was fortunate because special forces, um, Green Berets, they take really good care of their, um, of their, uh, spouses. And so... My CAO was just top notch. He was also a Green Beret. And so mm -hmm. he was taking care of me the way he would have taken care of his wife, you know, as far as just making sure that everything was handled for her rather than just leaving me with it. And I, I, I um, run a widow support group. And one thing I've heard over and over is that most of the time that's that's really abnormal. Most of the time, the CAOs pretty much don't know what they're doing and they just lead the book with them. It's and an they have to figure duty. it out. It's an ancillary duty for for most so they do baseline level training on it and a lot of the times especially for again i can only talk from the my community and officer tour is going to be about two years you could be assigned as the keiko for that two-year time period go through the minimum training and hopefully you never exercise said training in that course of that two-year period and then you move on so it's not at least in the world i came from it's not a primary job or a role Mm -hmm. which as a spouse on the receiving end, you're probably hoping for it to be exactly that. Like this is this person's sole function so they can help you navigate those incredibly difficult waters. And that's pretty much what they did. Um, and I've heard that a lot with, with, with the Green Beret spouses, that like third group, that USASOC makes sure that their spouses are really well taken care of and that their CAOs, that is their job during that time period. Yeah, that's what and you need. Yeah, because I, I didn't know what I was doing. There were so many offices and appointments and, and things because you're basically just, um, you know, retiring from the military. So you're doing all the paperwork your husband would have done, except you've never yeah. gone into these offices. You don't know where these are. These things are handled. And most people, it takes them years to get it done because it's it's crazy. Um, yeah. For me, I think my CAO had it done within three to six months for me. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good to hear. When did you start asking people what had happened? Pretty soon afterwards because of all of the news around it. So, um, you were know. You, were you able to watch the news? Did you have the desire to watch what I, the news was reporting about it? I did and I didn't. My father-in-law followed, um, you know, he read every news article and, and would share them with me. So then I'd start reading some of the news articles. And it was pretty quick um, that you began to see them reporting that this was a to, that, you know, it, it basically came across as there are leaks coming from the investigation that this was a, you know, a team of cowboys who had gone rogue. 
which anybody who knows Green Berets, you know, and, and me knowing my husband, I'm like, that's that's not possible that an entire team would go rogue. You might get one guy who goes out of his mind and, and does something crazy. But to think that anybody would follow them and do something that they don't have permission to do and that they would go rogue as a team is, is insane. There's only one environment where that makes sense, and it's Hollywood. Yeah. That'd be the great, it'd be a great script for a movie and people would probably eat it up. Green Beret team goes rogue, solves the Ukrainian crisis single-handedly. That's not <laughs> right. the way that shit works. <laughs> no, 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 because you're not going to have the assets. No. You're not going to have the backup. I You'd mean, run out of gas and your Hilux would be like, well, now nah, let's go back to base. Yeah, we're going to walk back, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Die of thirst on the way back. Yeah. Yeah. It's What's the saying? You know, in the first few days that some incident is being reported, you're better off not paying attention to what is reported on the news because mm -hmm. they're in a rush to be first, not necessarily accurate. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I initially attributed it, attributed it to was, you know, this is just reporters. They don't know anything. They're not getting anything straight. In fact, they're arguing over what the difference between a red beret and a green beret is, and they're getting that totally wrong. Yeah. And, you know, um, they were getting the ranks wrong and, and what the jobs are. I mean, they were getting so many basic I love facts it. wrong. An admiral in the army, I'm like, oh, yes. Tell me more about this <laughs> <Yes>. army admiral. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so that that was the kind of reporting that was going on. And I just was like, OK, you know, um, so and, and it was, you know, four Green Berets are killed. And I was like, well, technically it was two Green Berets and, and two support guys. And now they've actually been upgraded to Green Berets. Um, they've gotten honorary Green Berets, which was really cool. But um, at the time, it just it was all those little things that made me go, OK, when they're starting to report that they are a bunch of cowboys who have gone rogue, it makes me not trust what they're saying. And surely this didn't come out of um, the investigation. And, and, yeah. and when they're saying an anonymous source, I thought, OK, well, that too, like, come on. You know, I, I disagree with reporting by anonymous sources because. For sure. It will, and especially that soon to an incident like that, that is in an area that is that remote. Mm -hmm. I mean, pr I would have to estimate that these news organizations are not flying somebody there to actually interview people on the ground. So who knows where they're getting the information from? Yeah. Uh, more than likely. It's not defined by its accuracy is what is yeah. anecdotally from what I have seen, at least. And actually, when it comes to reporting on losses of military life, the first reports are almost always the most inaccurate yeah. because it takes time. And, it, and well, you know this better than most ever will. Military investigations are not fast and they're also not always complete, but they're often politicized. <laughs> so it gets very complicated very fast and it you get a lot of inaccuracy in the public um, domain yeah. because of that. So how did it um, how did it progress for you in the in the days and weeks after the notification? There there were a lot of things that took place. I mean, it was all over the news. Um, we received phone calls from President Trump and then that blew up because um, one of the widows felt that he had done something that had insulted her. And so, of course, um, at the time, there was a very, you know, in the... Uh in the um he was a polarizing figure right and so the media just basically wanted to play on that so that became the sole focus was this botched phone call and the argument between the two because then there were some tweets and i think for all of us who were grieving it was just it was it was pretty overwhelming yeah. um, because then everybody's calling for your opinion on your phone call and i thought it's not relevant because i wasn't on her phone call how was your call um, with the president it was great. You know, I mean, it was really good. He spoke to the kids. Ezekiel was obsessed with him at the time. He loved all the Trump memes. So and we had a button on the fridge that he pushed that would say Trump quotes. So um, oh, yeah. the button itself would spit out Trump quotes. Oh, yeah. Oh, like I forget, like oh, I'm going to be something like I'm really rich. It said all this crazy stuff that was just ridiculous. Shocker. Yeah. Yeah. I never would have guessed that a Trump button would spit out crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was hilarious. But so Zeke was so excited. He talked to him. Him. Isaac talked to him, um, you know, and he was just he was really sweet. And um, did you ever have a chance to talk to the other 
spouse directly about the phone call that she had had with him that and and get direct from her how it went because i could also see that being very twisted in media as well right and and that's kind of what i figure and honestly also like you're going through so much at the time it's like however she felt i mean being pregnant having kids yeah and just everything if if what she heard from him was insulting to her that's a good time to just let it go and not continue to argue back and forth you know but unfortunately that wasn't really what he did yeah um but you know well, twitter's the best place to have that argument yeah so and and after that i think it got so <laughs> twisted that yeah and everyone's commenting but then people were going on on her like the, somebody had set up a gofundme site for her so then people had to shut down the comments on there because they were going and saying horrible things to her so yeah. she, she i i doubt she would even want to talk about it and we never did um but she was living down in florida at the time because she was pregnant with with their third it probably so, was down with family for help and support. Yeah, so I never really wanted to bring it up with her because yeah. honestly, it was a sore spot. I think, I think overall, it blew up for everybody um, badly. Yeah, and and it really was a shame that she couldn't just say, "Hey, my feelings were hurt," without it turning into this huge thing, you know. Um, but that's what everybody remembers about the incident because the amount of um, press around it. And, um, but you know, he, he was wonderful to my family. I actually, when I was on the phone with him, he'd asked me, um, before we hung up, if there was ever anything he could do for us. And I said, yeah, actually, by the way, uh, we're going to be in Arlington. We'd like to go to the white house and I'd like to stay at your hotel. And, um, so that's what we did. He set up a, um, a whole thing for us. So we went and stayed at the hotel a couple days, buried Brian, Brian in Arlington, and then got a, um, white house tour and, met uh, Mike Pence and it, it was you know probably it, surreal at that moment it was surreal because honestly you're still kind of in that haze and um, I well, thought, how much time but with the funeral in Arlington how much time had elapsed between your first notification and that not even a month okay so, so, so yeah you're probably still living in a headspace that seems like you're looking through a cloud yeah I mean looking back on it it's it's surreal I see the pictures and I'm like wow we were like sitting in the president's theater and we were and and that's amazing, but um, it is amazing. But it would be, I feel like it would would have been more impactful if you would have had some time and space and distance away from the notification of the death of your husband. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, gl I'm really glad you got to to do those things, especially for your kids. Mm -hmm. But maybe they could have lined it up for you a few months later. You know, <laughs> I should have asked him that. Yeah, I should have planned it. <laughs> well, and of course, but, there's no you know. malicious intent, and I'm sure they yeah. would have bent over backwards to let you do whatever you want to do. Yeah. But it's like, who can process anything well, when and you're in that thing. phase? Yeah, I think if, if I, like, later looking back on it, I was like, oh, like, I, I couldn't fully grasp the gravity of it at the time like like how, how cool you? it was yeah. and 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 you know because we had a historian with us telling us like everything and and i nothing even stuck with me i it just it was too much so yeah lo looking back on it you know hindsight's twenty twenty, right so if i could have said can we do it six months out i have no doubt it would have been you know absolutely we'll set it up for you yeah but um you know in that moment it was just like we're going to be there can you set some stuff up for us while we're there? And I was really grateful that 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 you know that that all transpired the way it did because it did make it a little better, if it if you can even say that it was more just, I don't know. Like I said, you're a glass half full lady. <laughs> you're finding the silver lining in this. <laughs> Trying I, hard. I can appreciate that. I generally cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a month. How much are you hearing from the military about what had actually happened? Really not much at that point. I did have Colonel Moses, who was the um, group commander. He was stationed out of Germany at the time. He had stopped by and gave us a basic briefing. Um, uh, and we were told that essentially the team was on a standard mission and um, a routine mission was his exact words. And that um, they weren't really sure what happened. But um, they would give us more details as they got them. And I would find out later that he was actually part of the whole thing, setting up the three-part mission, and that he knew they weren't on a routine patrol. Yeah, it sounded like he was a, 
a part of the authorization in the chain of command. So he should have had a pretty good idea of yeah. what it is they were actually doing. Yeah, he sat on video teleconferences as they pushed them ahead towards the Mali border. Why do you think he watered that down when he was talking to you? I think that he did not have clearance to talk about it at that point. I think everybody had been told not to talk about it until the investigation was complete. But I don't know why you would um, come and, and say that you're going to brief us if you are not really going to give us any information. And they shouldn't. I mean, it's fine for him to come and give a condolence call. But I think if he's involved, then he shouldn't be briefing us with wrong information because he was involved. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so if somebody else wants to come and just say, this is where we're at now, we'll be releasing more information later, um, we're talking to everyone who was involved, that's fine. But to actually have the colonel who was involved coming in and briefing us and not giving us full, you know, that that was inappropriate. How was your father-in-law handling the lack of information? He was uh, frustrated, but he had run investigations as an officer in the Marines for years. So he believed, he goes, it, we just, it's going to take time, but the longer they take, the better because more the more detailed. accurate. Yep. So he believed fully that we would get the complete truth and that we would have all of our questions answered in the end. And so because of his faith in it, I, w- I was like, okay, well, he, w- he would know. So. Yeah, he lived through it, so he, he should know. Yeah. What rank did he retire at? Um, gosh, I don't remember. I'd have to ask him. He was an officer, though, right, in the Marine Corps? How long was he in for? He was. Uh, I want to say a full career. Oh, uh, yeah. He was up there. He had some of the shiny collar devices. Yeah, he, he might have. I, I'd, well, and I ask because it, sure. it also paints the picture for how well he understood the machine. Mm-hmm. And, and a career in the military is going to give you a pretty good idea of how the machine works and hopefully some insight as to where, huh, that doesn't seem quite right. Or yes, that seems in accordance with things that I saw in my career as well. Mm-hmm. So they did, when did they announce that they had started an event, or not that they announced, when did they tell you that they had started the investigation into the incident? Um, they had started that not long. It must have been like, I want to say within a week or two of um, of the actual incident. So initially, South Africa had opened an investigation and then AFRICOM shut that down and started their own. Mm-hmm. So and then and I believe that was just a few days apart that that kind of took place. And that was, I want to say, the week following the incident. Had you talked to any of the men that were on the ground with him that day? Um, At that point, yeah. But basically, they were just being quiet. Um, They had come back, come over to the house, gave their condolences and, and weren't, you know, just telling Brian stories, but not discussing anything to do with the incident. And it took me a while to realize that they actually were avoiding discussing the incident. Um, so several months passed before one of them, well, no, I guess it would have, would have been a month passed cause it would have been about November 7th when one of them came up to me after the unit memorial and just said, I wish we could say more. And he was clearly frustrated. He said, but we're not supposed to talk about it until the investigation's complete, essentially, um, indicating that they had some sort of gag order placed on them or just, you know clear um, direction not to speak. Hmm. Yeah, I've never personally encountered that. When I was reading that in the book, that seemed very odd to me. But also, I'm completely open to that just having not been my experience. Um, Because every time there's a loss of life, there is, there's of course an investigation, but I've never heard of anybody being prohibited in speaking to a family member. But again, that could be just my own experience. Well, they could speak to us, but they could not discuss they anything what they to were, do with, yeah. yeah, nothing to do with what happened that day. So they couldn't speak at all to anyone publicly, you know, even the family members, which I thought was interesting. I think it's bizarre because you're like somebody telling you about their experience that day has no bearing on the investigation. You know, the investigation yeah, will... F- should figure out everything from a satellite view to a granular group view on the ground. And if somebody wanted to talk to you about their experience that, that day, that's not going to change the course of an investigation. Mm-hmm. So, and then uh, from reading the book, it sounds like the investigation was, or not the investigation, what do they call it at the end of it? Uh, the briefing mm-hmm. was supposed to come and it came much later than was originally discussed. Yeah. It kept getting pushed back. So, um, 
there were multiple things that happened, um, but the main thing that pushed it back was, I think it was in January, the end of January, we got word that um, a video had surfaced. It was created by ISIS. It was a head cam video um, of the death of my husband, Jeremiah and Dustin. Um, and so they were trying to Basically, they were working with news organizations trying to keep that tamp down, um, mm-hmm. and they thought they could prevent it from coming out. Um, and so, but they were like, now that we've found this video, we need to, you know, see if we can find a, a full head cam video. We need to see what we can find, and we need to look into this and, and see if it brings up new evidence. So the investigation is going to be lengthened. Um, and unfortunately, I think about two months later, that video was released by CBS News and then also SoftRep. Yeah. So as we spoke on the phone the first time we were discussing having you come out here and talk about this, what's the way, what's the best way to describe this? I saw that soft rip video, the video itself. I'm hoping that you have never seen it. It's not easy to watch. Um, I cannot believe that CBS would feel that from a journalistic perspective, there would be something to gain from it. But what drives me insane is that SoftRep watermarked that fucking video and released it on their channels. And that's where it actually hit my radar because that is a company that was owned by an ex-team guy. And uh, what's the way I could say this without having legal repercussions later on? I hope he and I end up in the same place. At some point in time, that's probably the safest way that I could say that. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people that would say similar things. You know, I um, it's there. There's there's no there's no value add to anything by watermarking that video and then publishing it. And I know that the justification was, oh, it's you know, I'm I'm the CEO. It was somebody else who did that. Fuck you. You're the CEO. Anybody who works for you, you know. You're going to put out this type of video and they, and they didn't bump this by you and be like, hey, boss, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. Um, it's inexcusable. And that's and that's the best way that I can put it. I'm sorry that that, that video ever saw the light of day. I, I just don't understand from a journalistic perspective. And I'm, and I'm talking about CBS now at this point, not software, why they would think that there is a need to put that out there. Yeah, no, I agree. It's terrorism, you know, and that's what I keep telling people because I I get people arguing, you know, or asking me what my problem is with it. And I'm like, it isn't just because my husband was killed. It's because this is terrorism and it's used to terrorize the family families. That's what terrorism is. And so you are actively participating in terrorizing the families. And I'm talking about my sons watching their father die and yeah. Jeremiah's daughters as teenagers when it was released, watching their father die and having their the friends. Oh, yeah. Their friends commenting to them. <sighs> Everybody in their age group is now playing games that are made based off the video of yeah. my husband's death and my kids have seen it jeremiah's kids have seen it you know and everybody's you know dustin and jeremiah and my husband brian their moms have seen it there it's never okay it is terrorism and you know no matter how many ways you say it's news you know there's an excuse you are you are terrorizing people and we talk about we care about ptsd and, or PTS, you know, we care about the men on the ground. And these guys coming back have seen it. Yeah. And um, how do you watch what you just went through happen and your friends die and not have that affect you? And if you've got PTS, how does that not further push you? I, I just, I, I can't, I think it drives me nuts when I hear a lot of lip service coming from the same people who promote and, and, and um, share these types of videos. Yeah. They're do well, they'll give it lip service, but what they're actually doing is just try to they're trying to increase their user base is all they're trying to do. That's why you watermark a video like that. It doesn't mm-hmm. add to the message, good, bad, ugly, indifferent. It just it's like, hey, this is us. This is who we are. At the expense of I mean imagine the most catastrophic incident happening in your life and then having it 
readily available on the internet for your kids to see. Like I just, I don't, there's no excuse for that whatsoever. Yeah. And I think what blows my mind too, and, and this is where social media has become such an issue with me is while it's a great tool, um, and you know, they've gotten into, uh, you know, blocking and, and, you know, um, yeah, but it goes live first and that's the problem. Yeah. You know, even the, I think a lot of the social media tools use artificial intelligence, just given the volume Mm -hmm. and it just takes one asshole to screen grab. Yeah. It it happens to politicians all the time. They say something shocker, really stupid. They delete the tweet, but somebody's like, I already got you. And then they post that, which gets posted and posted and screen grab. So yeah, once somebody hits publish, it's, it's completely out of the hands of the person that put that up there. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I don't have the words for, how how angered it makes me that that video exists and that people did with it what they did. So I'm sorry that you've mm-hmm. had to live through that. Thank you. Yeah. How did it continue from there? When did you finally get sat down by the military? It was the end of April when they sat us down. And um, so we go into this big conference room and I'm thinking, okay, we're going to get a detailed timeline of events on the ground. We're going to kind of get the minute by minute breakdown. And, um, and you know, they told us that, like, we're going to, any questions you have, we will answer for you. We will speed up, slow down, back up, whatever. Um, and what I found was that as I asked more questions, because they started right off with that narrative that I'd heard on the media, which is, this team essentially went rogue, except they tried to more pin it on one guy, Captain Parazzini, filed a false con op. This con op, you know, was misleading, and therefore they say they went on a civ mill reconnaissance mission. In reality, there's no such thing, and so they went on a kill capture mission, and and um, because of that, they didn't have higher uh, approvals, and, mm-hmm. and that affected the end result, which is... Total bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and and when I when I looked into it, the civ the civ mill reconnaissance mission was completely legitimate. The reasons behind them doing a civ mill made complete sense, um, and they did a civilian military reconnaissance mission. So even though the guy at Africom says there was no definition for a civ mill reconnaissance mission. Um, everyone I've talked to has done civ mill reconnaissance missions. So it does exist. He just didn't have a doctrinal definition for it. And so yeah. it turned into an argument of doctrinal definitions. That and had no bearing on the outcome. No. And and I, and in the end, that's the thing. There, there were three con ops and his was the first of three. And the other two were created higher up the chain. And those are really what led directly to the ambush. And the final one didn't even do a second threat assessment, which they actually lied to me during the briefing. My father-in-law asked them if a second threat assessment was done. And they said yes. And we found out later that they did not before sending my husband's team up alone um, to the Mali border. Do you think, I remember that section in the book, It's um, it was uh, it was a general, correct, that answered that question, and then a lawyer jumped in as well. Mm-hmm. Do you think the general just didn't know, so he said that, so he'd be able to move on in the briefing? I believe so, and the lawyer knew that the right answer was yes, no matter what. So, Just so it could continue on and it wouldn't lead to further follow-on questions, more than likely? I don't even know if it was that it wouldn't lead to further follow-on questions as much as it wouldn't... The answer had to be yes for them to look cover good, their ass to co- yeah to cover themselves yeah i should i should break this down here a little bit too so a con ops for people who haven't heard that term is a concept of operations and for you to go outside of the wire um you're gonna have to brief a higher headquarter you don't just <laughs> as an o3 on the ground as a captain you are not like hey guys today we're gonna go and do this you can have that idea but you're gonna have to get permission from another level of authority depending on what it is that you're gonna do you can do some local stuff, but if you're going to go anywhere like a military operation, you have to have a concept of operation depending on what that concept of operation is proposing, at least in the world that I came from, is going to determine who's going to bottom line that. And it might be your task unit commander. It might be the battle space commander. And if you're going to do something exceptionally high risk, it might be well up the tree of the DOD. But it gets approved and it's 
the five W's, you know, who, what, where, when, and why. There's a lot of things that go into it, but it covers, I'm going to say one activity or one evolution, and then you would come back to base. And if you want to go do another one, or you get retasked into the field, and it's going to deviate from your original mission, there's going to be another con ops or concept of operations that's created. And that is also going to have to be bottom line somewhere. It can happen that you're retasked in the field. When you're in the field, we don't have our lovely ruggedized laptops that we have PowerPoint on, which by the way, I'm an expert at PowerPoint. It's probably my most useful skill after being a SEAL, uh, that in typing. But each one of these things, so these documents are created and they're sent up for approval and you're just, you're not running around doing this stuff before somebody is at least notified and signs off on it. So when I was reading the book and I, and I didn't understand this either, the concept of operations that uh, the captain, is it Perzoni? Perzini. Perzini put in, they, they completed that mission. And it sounds like everything that they did after that was based off of subsequent concepts of operation. Meaning that that original concept of operation, let's say that there was, let's take the most negative viewpoint humanly possible, that he lied on the con ops, which he didn't, in my opinion. And you go there and they did not enter, uh, they did not have enemy contact, Regardless of what was on that first con ops, it was successfully completed and then they were rebriefed in the field based off concepts of operation that other people created. So that first concept of operation has nothing to do with what happened at the end at the end of the day. But it seems like the military attempted to hang their hat on that document for reasons that I I mean I know in my gut what the reasons are why I think that they would do that, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Nor does it make sense to brief the family members on that because it's a, it's a very slippery slope. Families aren't going to know about concepts of operation or the levels of authority and approval, the second risk assessment and matrix that needs to be done for every concept of operations. Well, and I think that they were hoping that I wouldn't even grasp what a concept of operations was. What they didn't expect was that Henry and I had talked about it extensively. And so he, I understood them by the time we went in. And we had heard talk in the media about this, like, misleading con op. And so by the time we went in, I'm like, well, then I want details on this misleading con op and what made it misleading. And so that's actually when they got upset was because I think they thought we would just buy in and move on and not ask any deep questions. Yeah, it seemed like in the book that they were claiming that it was cut and pasted. Let me right. just tell you the amount of cutting and pasting that goes on. So the concept of operations is that. It's the concept. And then in a normal planning cycle, it'd be like 72 hours where we would sit around in front of PowerPoint and look at weather metrics and illumination and terrain. And then we would do another huge brief, the patrol leader's order, to all the people that are going to go into the field. All of this stuff is electronically based. Most of the operations have some level of similarity. You're cutting and pasting on every single document to include the times that I sent the wrong information in because I was so cut and pasted that – and that's why you send it up the chain of command and they can bounce it back if they say, hey uh, – did you mean to say helicopters when you guys are actually going on the ground? You're like, no, I, that was a typo. And what by that, I mean, I hadn't slept enough and had enough copy to cut and paste from the correct document. But 80% of the stuff is the same. To say it was, it was um, like mischievously put together because they cut and pasted is a, is a total, a total bullshit lie about how these documents are actually created. Anybody who's ever done a military con op or has gone overseas for an operational deployment, understands the Apple C, Apple V button, or whatever it is on uh, PCs. I don't know who uses those. I mean, it's 2022. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super yeah. common. Yeah. And, you know, and that's why as we're sitting in there and they're briefing us on this and they're saying he cut and pasted and, and you know, the first con op was misleading. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and they're saying all this stuff. And by then I've talked about it so much with Henry because, I mean, we, you know, they gave us seven months to discuss it. Right. Yeah. So by then everything they're telling me is that they're going out of their way to Blake to blame Mike Perzini, but they're giving me basically BS reasons. 
And so then I was asking deeper questions about the other con ops because my thought is, okay, so these are your reasons that you're hanging on Mike, but what are your reasons for not hanging anything on the two follow-on con ops, which led to re- directly to them being up there yeah. without backup? Um, hugely, like, they, they had no... Um, they. The assets were just atrocious. They had no assets, really. I mean, one um, one drone that was running out of fuel, and that's really all they had. Do you happen to know what kind of drone it was? Oh, gosh, I don't remember. Was it a Predator or a Reaper? No. Okay, so, and I asked that because as I was reading through the book and the size of the force that had amassed, people like, well, you know, not people, but... It seems as if people in the investigation process had no idea how a size that large could amass or that would maybe know that Americans are coming. I ask because both of the Predators and Reapers have a very distinct noise signature. And when they fly overhead like it did on the objective that they went to for hours at a time, if you're familiar with what it sounds like, you Mm -hmm. know that somebody is watching and it's also likely that they're going to commit an asset and then shortly commit a ground force to oh, it as well. Okay. So we used to do that all the time. We would have ISR platforms circling overhead. And you can, and well, I have no idea the asset that they had in Africa. If it was a Pred or a Reaper, they can push it off a farther distance and it's quieter and the sensors have a maximum distance that they can look. Hmm. But you can hear, and you hear it on the ground. It it sounds like a lawnmower. Well, I knew it wasn't a predator. Okay. It might have been but a Reaper. But it could have been a Reaper. What I do know about it, the way it was described to me was that it had basically the, the sights on it, because we were told over and over that there was just one tree up there. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand why they would keep telling us that. Um, and what yeah, like 100 I, plus people can't hide under a tree. Right. Exactly. And and so that made no sense because when the guys went up there, they said, no, there were, there were trees everywhere. So I was asking about the discrepancy um, to who did I Major Alan Van Sant. I asked him about that and he said, well, these are the drones. Basically, it's like looking from, you know, all these feet up through a straw straight down. And so all you're seeing is what's directly below you. You don't see much. If he told you that he's mm-hmm. completely full of shit. Unless they're talking about antiquated technology, but we're, we're talking 2017 at this point. The sensors on at least the platforms that I'm familiar with, um, they have daytime cameras, they have infrared capability, they have zoom capability, and they can slave and lock. You like you can lock onto an individual and then the, the ISR platform can fly around and the the optic is still looking at it. But they might they might have antiquated stuff because I've heard that from a couple people. That, so they might. They had very bad. But very bad visibility. So that's very possible. But I also bet that that means that the asset, whatever it was, probably was at a lower altitude to compensate for the poor electronic capability, which is an audible signature on the ground that can alert people to, A, there's somebody looking overhead, and B, depending on how they had used that asset previously, let's say the first time you're in a new battle space, you throw an ISR asset overhead and it circles, and a day later or two hours later, ground forces show up. If you repeat that pattern multiple times, you're tipping your hat to the people on the ground that you might be targeting so they have time to prepare. Well, and and that was a big argument that Captain Parazzini had when I ended up interviewing him is he goes, listen, like we were being sent like, you know, right away every time like SIGINT would pop up. So we're going out on single source signals intelligence over and over and over and over. Yeah. And um, And single source anything, humid and SIGINT is, uh, to go back to statistics, the most unreliable. Right. And and if you're, and I mean, let's say this guy, right, because we find out that one of the the village chief has has the terrorist cell phone in his His number number stored in his phone. So let's say the terrorist notices every time he turns his phone on, you know, within... X amount of hours, the U.S. is showing up, right? So yeah. that's that's basically what was happening here, and that's why the team was getting so nervous about the pattern of their missions, um, because every time they would get a ping, these guys would show up, but they'd instantly yeah. go on a mission, and that's why he wasn't happy with them. One of the many reasons he wasn't happy with them going up to the Mali border, because it happened the same thing. Hey, we just got another piece of the same SIGINT and we want you to now go chase, chase him up here. You know? It's one of the biggest mistakes that soldiers and ground force commanders can make is to us underestimate the 
the enemy that they may be fighting. It's really easy, but oh, they're they're stupid. Like these people are so far technologically behind. I mean, pattern recognition is is not that tough. Like mm-hmm. you said, somebody turns their phone on and like six hours later, here come the Hiluxes. Like, huh, that's weird. The first time you may not connect the two. Five, six, seven, ten times down the road, every time you're on the phone, the next you know these vehicles are coming in here. It's like, oh, interesting. Then you know, let's say you're. You want to figure out just to, to make sure that your hypothesis is correct. You go to a different village and you fire up your phone. Oh, and the vehicles still show up there? Well, guess what now? Now I can lay an ambush for you because every time I turn this phone on, you're going to come running. Yep. Yeah. It's one of the biggest mistakes that people can make is to underestimate their enemy. They don't have to be technologically complex to understand human behavior. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, and, and I guess Captain Perizzini, that was one of his big arguments, and he tried to argue it from the beginning and basically was just shut down and said, no, you're going on these missions. So this this would be a question that I would ask him, and I'm curious if you ever, ever asked him this. Did he ever get to the point where he was just going to say no, regardless of what he was ordered to do? Because I tried to put myself in his shoes, reading the book, having operated in elements that are about that size and very, very far from support. And it might have ended up costing him his career or his role at that ODA. But I was trying to put myself in that position and think of what would I have done? And I think, and of course, this is easy to say this sitting in Montana, I think I would have said no. And I would have turned around regardless of what they had said to me. Did he ever say that that crossed his mind when you talked to him? Yeah, he said he was he was right there. He said it, it reached a point where he had argued to the point that 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 was the only choice left was say no and go back and pack his bags and head home or yeah. just do it and Yeah, and I and by by asking that I am by no means Monday morning quarterbacking anybody. Mm-hmm. I was just I was curious if you had asked him that in the in the course of sitting down and talking with him. Yeah, we talked multiple times and and that was one thing. In fact, all the guys on the team were like he argued until it was he was going to lose his job over it and then we were still going to go ahead. So yeah. he just uh basically we at that point the decision was, well, there haven't been any teams attacked and we're going to complete this and get back as fast as we can. And uh that was kind of their thought process. At what point did you realize that you were going to start digging into this on your own, absent what the military was telling you? So after our family briefing, there was I, I kind of left it knowing that there were more questions and answers than I, you know, I had more questions leaving than I had going into it. But I thought as long as that's not a good brief. Then. No, <laughs> no. And I thought as long as nobody's getting punished, um, then I'm OK with it. Because, okay, I don't really fully understand what happened, but at some point I can ask these guys. But as long as they're not losing their jobs over it and, you know, et cetera, then then that's fine. Um, Everyone can just move on and I'll get my answers from them and, and, and leave it alone. So what ended up happening was, I think it was a week later or a few days later, General Waldhauser and all of AFRICOM did a media brief on this investigation. And it was all over the news. And in it, he stated that while all teams on the continent were performing well, this team was not indicative of what special operators do. And he also indicated that Captain Perizzini and all of those who were responsible would be held accountable. And so after he managed to disparage my husband and all those who fought and died alongside him and made it clear that everyone was going to be punished, um, that's when I decided that uh, I would do my best to counteract that. How'd you start? Um, I talked to the guys and asked them if they'd be willing to interview with me one-on-one. And they said yes. So one at a time they came over and we went through the details. And I think what they told me was so different than what AFRICOM told me that right away I was kind of blown away by just the difference in the stories. But then I thought, well, that might be completely different than, say, what an officer would say or maybe the guys um, with Team Arlet. So I interviewed the commander of Team Arlet, and he backed Green up. Green Bray as well, right? Yes, yes. And so um, he, he ran a Helleborn unit up out of Arlet, and they were supposed to meet my husband's team there and got turned around, and he 
basically told me all the same story. Um, and they recovered a lot of the bodies. And so, um, talked to them. I talked to guys who were back at the AOB running communications on the ground, same story. Um, and I talked to Major Alan Van Son, who was gone on paternity leave, but he would have been working out of, out of the AOB as the commander. And um, he ended up losing his job over the incident. And then I spoke to the former South Africa commander as well, just to kind of run by like operations and, and how everything said, how everyone, how everyone said things went versus mm-hmm. how um, the, the, higher ups and and how the um, investigators had told us they'd gone so kind of getting his take on everything so it sounds like almost instantly you were getting a different narrative of what had happened Mm -hmm. have you ever been afforded the opportunity to sit down and challenge the military's narrative with the investigating officers or anybody who is no have you asked for it no probably should i should try i would like to be there for that (laughs) i will fuck their shit up yeah yeah i i I would love to be able to do that and bring in some people who have actually been active um operators who who also um you know know more than i do because like you you know all these you know all the different drones all the different i i only know what i've studied and learned since since the incident to kind of inform myself on what happened that day but um what worries me is that you have put in i think substantially more effort and time than a lot of people would which lends them towards believing everything that they may be told about something like this and uh i couldn't be more proud of my military service i'm very th- incredibly thankful every single day that I made the choice that I did to serve. But the military is not perfect and neither are the people that are inside of the military. And I have found, this is not always the case, but I have found it to be the case sometimes is that as you ascend the chain of command, the desire to cover one's own ass and deflect shit downhill increases. Um, And when people don't know necessarily what to ask, it gives those other people the opportunity to to navigate a little bit more freely because they, you, they, if you don't know what you're hearing on the receiving end how could mm-hmm. you possibly formulate questions off of that yeah that's absolutely true i mean fortunately i had brian's dad who had all the background imagine um, if you didn't yeah I, I would have had no idea i would have known something was off but where do you begin i would have had to find like a, a subject matter expert and begin asking them and who wants to sit there with me you know 24 hours a day asking a ton of real basic questions but i am hoping that with this with how i've handled it that going forward People like Colonel Moses and Lieutenant Colonel Painter, who basically just tried to roll things downhill, that they'll uh, think twice because yeah. they know that it is possible that someone is going to stand up, say their name and and tell everyone what they did wrong and who they blamed. I think one of the – again, like I said, I finished the book this morning. I think one of the biggest mistakes – and I don't know if this was intentional or not. This is – this would be a decision that was well above any pay grade that I was ever involved with. But to allow either SOC Africa or AFRICOM to conduct the investigation, I think was a mistake. I think they should have brought somebody in who was not involved at all and who had no chips in the game on the result of the investigation. And I feel like it would have been substantially different, the information that you would have received. And I think... I don't want to use the term blame, um, but I think that the critical failures that may have been identified would be a lot higher up the chain of command than the investigation reported to you. Right. No, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, as we went in from the very beginning and even now, I never wanted anybody held accountable or blamed or, you know, punished, yeah. losing their careers. Lose, none of that is what I was interested in. What I was interested in was let's let's hear the facts and let's improve the situation for the men on the ground to make sure that this doesn't happen again to the next group that's out there working in my husband's place. But unfortunately, when you handle it the way they handled it, you put the next group of guys who are coming in at just as much risk as my husband's team was. They don't get their assets improved. Nothing improves for them because the wrong people are held into account. 
You know, we could have just said, hey, no one's getting in trouble, but let's be honest, what improvements do we need here? In my experience with the military, there will be no improvements made until there are people held accountable and that there are people who lose their careers over it. Um, the <laughs> literal and metaphorical distance between people who bottom line concepts of operations or warning orders or five W's or PLO, whatever you want to call it, whatever brief, and they do that from a different country, the, the, the distance between those individuals and the people on the ground who are going to execute those operations, it's impossible to it's impossible to describe. I have no doubt that your husband's team was doing the absolute best they possibly could with the limited assets that they had available. But if missions were being planned above their head and they were being directed to go, because it's my understanding that they were supposed to originally be the blocking force. The helicopter um, element from Arlet was going to come in, which makes sense. They were actually even going to offset as well. I think they were going to come in from the north. Your husband's uh, element was going to be to the south, pushing people towards them. It's like, okay, that makes sense. The timeline that they wanted them to do it on, the fact that they were you know, running out of water, they weren't necessarily equipped, and they had voiced all of those opinions up the chain of command, and it still came back with these additional taskings, you know, if they're not the ones planning it in the field, whoever is planning it, wherever they are planning it, is responsible to to hit all of the wickets that the, the battlefield commander would be responsible to hit if he was planning the operation. If they're not looking at Kazovac, if they're not looking at a QRF and timelines and how far out on this front leading edge of the razor blade that these units are going to be, and they tell them to go do this, and something goes wrong, and they don't get held accountable for that, nothing will ever change. Nothing will ever change because I can tell you right now what's always going to be the case. The people with their boots on the ground are going to do the absolute best that they possibly can. And it's really easy for people who don't have to go actually do anything other than John Hancock, the con op, to put people in a place or ask them to do something that is well beyond that risk assessment and matrix. And that is not the fault of the battlefield commander. He has the ability. I mean, yes, he could have gone back and packed his bags and maybe lost his job. And he would have lost that for sure because military is a rock, paper, rank organization. And that boulder is going to roll down hill and crush the 03, not the 05. But if they're not going to hold people accountable, nothing's going to change ever. And and that's that's where I'll depart. And you and yeah. I will disagree about what we would <laughs> want to see come out of this. I do want people held yeah. accountable. The military isn't perfect. But they need to be transparent about their failures. And the only way to ensure those failures don't happen again is to be honest about what actually happened in the first place. Where were the mistakes made? And for those higher ranking officers who signed off on this, and then it sounds like we're not complete in their truth when it comes to when it comes to or came to what actually happened, they need to have their heads chopped off metaphorically when it comes to their military careers. Yeah. That will actually get people to pay attention. Well, and to be honest, I, I felt that the, I didn't care about the um, punishments at all up until they lied to us. At this point, yeah. I feel like once you've gone so far that you will lie and let other people take the blame, then you shouldn't be leading anybody because you will cost lives in the future. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's no guarantee if they had told the truth from the beginning that their careers would necessarily be ended but it could have improved the operational environment for anybody else who goes to that country, who goes to AFRICOM or SOC Africa, and has to operate in those environments. Yep. It's, uh, yeah, war is a hell of a thing. And, uh, you know, they say it all the time, you know, these, the lessons that we learn are, are learned in blood. Like, okay, can we stop repeating certain lessons? Yeah. It's, uh, unless, those higher up are bleeding as well. I don't think that'll ever be the case. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You're right. What, uh, how did Henry feel about the brief that you guys received? I think he left the same way I did. We were very disillusioned. Reignited the fire in the Marine Corps officer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we sat around talking about it, just trying, just kind of going like, what did we get from that? Did we get anything? Did we get any answers? Just kind of, I think, blowing our minds 
that we were left still feeling lost, you know, that, yeah. that we didn't have any answers. I think I think we all were very confused by that and not sure what to do with it or where to go with it. I think we were all kind of surprised. Um, but I did ask him when it came to the media brief how he felt because he watched it before I did. And all he said, all he said to me is, I won't say anything except um, I'm ashamed to call myself a Marine after listening to General Waldhauser. That's a that's a pretty bold statement coming from a retired Marine Corps officer. Yeah. Did it seem like when you were talking to the members of Brian's ODA that there was a sense of relief that they were finally able to talk to you about what happened? T- to some extent and with different ones. With some of them, I think they they were very uh, hesitant. Um, you know, I think it's pretty typical to not want to talk about it with too many people other than maybe the guys who were there yeah. so they, I think for them speaking with me was very different and initially they were concerned about you know I think hurting me or you know just the pain that that would cause um, and, and you know as they told me from the beginning we don't want you to get in trouble or to be involved but at that point I mean there's nothing the government can do well <laughs> I'm sure there's, <laughs> you might get audited 17 years in a row, but there's nothing the military can do to you. Right. Yeah, I know. I ended up telling them, you know, it's like, what are they going to do? Like, kill my husband, lie to me, show his death on TV. It's kind of been done. Yeah. Um. So at that point, I didn't have anything to lose. But um, I think for them, it was just, you know, sitting down and talking is, is always hard in the aftermath of those things because you bring up things that you want to forget. Yeah, but I also think it could maybe bring a sense of closure for them as well, especially if they were told that they couldn't talk about it to begin with. Um, Because I can only imagine from your perspective, one of the probably the biggest burning questions was what happened? Yeah. Yeah, especially when you have, you know, a news organization reporting from thousands of miles away, probably based off of hearsay and, you know, six degrees of separation information. Yeah, that's exactly right. How's your dad doing with, or how's Henry doing with it now? Um, you know, I think it's like with any loss. I mean, obviously with the book and finding the truth. And I mean, yeah. Brian's parents are just so happy that, that, um, that I took this route and that we did get to the truth. And I think that brought a big sense of relief as far as closure. I mean, these things you don't always, you don't, you, you never get closure. I mean, they lost their youngest son and they only had two sons. So that's, that's rough. You know, every, it's, every day is different, but that's why I moved by, um, just, I moved down the road from them. So they have, um, my the boys with them. Man. Yeah. So like Ezekiel and Isaac are with them right now and they're, 14 and 15 and exactly like their dad. So it's great, you know, <laughs> high energy and grandpa's running around in circles with them, but yep. keeping them busy. So, yeah. When did you decide you were going to write a book? Um, well, initially I had actually just started writing a book right after Brian died because I wanted to capture all the stories and have them for the kids because I felt like boys need to know who their dad dad is where they come from because that really helps create who you will become and I thought gosh at 9 and 11 there's so much they're going to miss and I need to be able for them to understand who he is and so initially I just was writing something that I would self-publish and and give them each a copy so they could read it when they needed to feel close to him and um, it was after uh, the statement by General Waldhauser that I basically tossed that aside and was like, I'll get to that later. And I'm going to write this because whenever there's something where there's a big military incident and everybody's lied to, there's a book, right? So, and I thought the next thing I know, there's going to be media wanting to do this, but the only person who's actually going to care, like really care and do it right is going to be me and these guys. Have you been able to share it with the other family members? Um, They know about it. A lot of them have read it. Um, I just kind of let them decide because it's it's a hard subject, you know. It is, and I could almost, it, without I say this without judgment of any kind, I could almost see it really depends on the person. Some may want to actually accept the narrative and move on, and others may not have it 
in them to dig into it any deeper. It's already such a horrific incident as it is. You know, they may want to just rebuild and move on. Yeah. That's yeah, rough for sure. How are your sons doing? They're doing really well. You know, Ezekiel, by the way, is the coolest name ever. Isn't it awesome? It is my one of my favorite chokes in jujitsu, which I don't think you thought I was going to go that direction with it. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It is an amazing choke. Um, and I didn't even really know that word. Um, until I started jujitsu, and <laughs> it's it's one of my favorites. So when I read that in the book, I was like, yes. Maybe Even that's though I know what Brian liked it, he was Brian was into jujitsu, and he never told me that was a choke. That's funny. How long had he been doing jujitsu? Long time. Hmm. Yeah, he'd actually he, when I first did met he him, pick that name. I did. Okay. He yeah. he probably was just like, oh yeah, that's a good one. We should go with. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> when I met him, he told me he was a cage fighter. I didn't know what that was, and I was like, is he trying to like show off? <laughs> I didn't like know what that meant. So yeah, he used to do a lot of MMA and, yeah. and all of that. So of course he did. Yeah. In between doing chess and uh, mathematics and online poker play. Yeah, of yeah. course. Why he, not? In his free time. <laughs> yeah. So the kids are doing well? They are, yeah. They actually do jujitsu and um, Awesome. Uh, gosh, what else are they into? Skiing. I've been teaching them to ski. So Zeke's better than me now. So I had to go back to my snowboard. Um, cause I don't want to be, you know, can't be put to shame. Yeah. And um, you can always kick him over. That's true. I'm just saying. I'm a lot faster on my snowboard. It's hard to say why little people <laughs> fall over on skis and snowboards. Well, Who's to say? He's a lot bigger than me now. He's like six one. So, um, and he's built like his dad. He's real solid. So I, I'd have to be a pretty good kick to get him over. Yeah. Yeah. I'd go with the shove with a little bit of speed. Take your size yeah. with some momentum and just yeah. push him off to the side. Yeah, preferably into trees. If I'm on skis, though, I would definitely be the one who fell. So I'll do it on my snowboard. Knock Fair. him over. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that they're that they're doing well. How much of a memory of their dad do they have? It's surprising. They have quite a bit, um, and and they rehash the same stories over and over, which is great. Yeah. And um, I try to constantly tell stories about him. And so a lot of times, you know, Zeke will say something, or Isaac will say something, and you know, they'll they'll say things like, "Oh, Dad would say." You know, and it's like, yeah, he would say that. So so they have enough memories. I mean, nine is awfully young. It was one of my main concerns. Um, I, I never was necessarily worried about myself. I, I've always to this day, you know, my kids now are 18, 16 and 13. And they're all about to level up. Birthday season is getting wow. ready to fire off. And I, I have so much more concern for them than for myself. But I do remember times... Where even like or a training trip or you're getting ready for a deployment and you just have that moment of if something were to happen, would they actually remember me or would they only remember me through the stories that people told about me? It's two very different things. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, it's it's really nice when they say dad would say this. And I realize like, yeah, that those are things he would actually say. And they do remember that. And that's that's a huge relief because I, I don't want them to only remember the things I tell them. Yeah. Have either of them expressed a desire to join the military? Oh, yeah. Ezekiel pretty much, he's, the guy is all about guns and... and That's uh, called being a young man. Well, uh, <laughs> he's a little extra, but <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on there, um, if they do have the desire to join the military? How would that land with you? My only thought with it is that I want them to be a little older when they join, like we were, just so it's more of a, a, of a decision where... He's deciding exactly what he wants based off of life experience rather than going in and being recruited and being talked into something and then getting in over his head. So, you know, I'd like him to be 20 at the minimum, hopefully yep. 22, 23 when he joins. Um, I, can, I can agree with that headspace for sure. Yeah. So and that's uh, that's easy kill. Isaac is more he he likes the doctor end of it. And so I see, you know, he's been saying he's going to be a doctor since he was like five. So um, I don't know what kind, but that's his main interest. Yeah. Sounds like you have your hands full. I do. But they're really good kids. <laughs> fortunately, it's like if, if my hands were full and they were like, you know, hellions, that would be one thing. Yeah. But they are just like super well behaved straight a students just you know super mellow kids which is not how it was when they were little i think they either go through the hellion stage when they're little or when they're old you know when they were little it was two hour tantrums and isaac would be running away from home while i'm dragging zeke screaming or you know whatever 
but at least it's not now when they can drive away, you know. Yeah, have they started driving yet? Um, this summer will be the will be yeah. You know, people say that when they're smaller, it's easier. And what I've realized is that the problems are just less complex when they're smaller. <laughs> you don't have to worry about drinking and driving or yeah. exposure from social circles to things that you would never want them exposed to or the random browser on the internet that can lead you to all sorts of things. Yep. Oh yeah. There's, there's some interesting stuff that has gone on. That's for sure. And as a mom of boys, oh boy, the amount of internet, um, uh, you know, control that I have to have. And even then just remember that no amount of control that you have over their internet usage will stop them. Oh no, I know. <laughs> Trust me. There's been a few times that I'm like, like you do realize that I will make you watch that with me next time. Oh. And they're like, what? And then they were mortified. Never. That's a good move. Yeah. Yeah. I have Cause a... they know I'll follow through on whatever I say. I'm not sure I'll follow through on that one, but <sighs> I had uh... <laughs> scared them good enough. Somebody I know, their son had a phone fully locked down with, you know, can't use this, that or the other. But they found one of the apps on the phone allowed them to launch a browser inside of the app. And I think this kid was like 10 and he Googled boobies. That was legitimately oh the term. <laughs> I didn't think he ended up telling on himself, but. That just goes to show you that for the parents who are like, okay, I'm going to lock this down and that down. It's like, just forget about it. I mean, don't, mm -hmm. actually, I take that back. Don't forget about it. Do all of those things, but then just realize you're fighting a losing battle. Yeah, you yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad I didn't have the internet when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I wish we didn't have it now. I mean, and it's for boys and girls too, because like the social media stuff, oh my gosh, like as a girl, I would have hated hated that that would have just made all the social i see it with my 13 things. year old daughter um i didn't i didn't realize how vicious 13 year old 12 14 girls of that age can be towards each other holy cow it's gnarly some of the stuff you yeah. read you're like oh okay so you're the devil <laughs> yeah it's yeah tough what would you want to come from your book, if you could have it impact the military and they were to make a change, what would you want that change to be? Hmm, that's a big question. Um, I would like to see that there is more transparency, that they come up with a way to have more transparency in investigations. We can't keep lying to the family members about what happened to their loved ones that's unacceptable not to mention blaming guys on the ground yeah well, well sometimes the guys on the ground are responsible for yeah. clarity i guess what i mean by that is blaming the people who aren't responsible in order to cover for those who are I and mean, we, we can't do that would you want them to go back and revise the results of their investigation yeah i would be happy if 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 a whole new investigation was opened up by a completely separate you know, entity outside of AFRICOM, you know, just and do a very thorough job. I think they'd find a lot. Based off the investigation that was concluded and the findings, what was the overall greater impact? I remember reading there, I can't remember the two names. It seems like there were two people whose promotions have at least been delayed up until this point. But other than that, was there any changes, sweeping changes at all that came from it? No, everyone said they they offered new trucks, but from what I've heard, it didn't really make much difference. Yeah. Um, they give them different options, and I'd have to ask, uh, re-ask some people about as far as the trucks and, and if... Yeah. They were talking about armored vehicles, et cetera, but when, when you're in Africa, you don't need armored vehicles. That wasn't really relevant. They needed something with a big enough engine yeah. um, to keep them out of the dirt and so that they could put more ammunition on. So really, even though they were given more vehicles, they still weren't the right vehicles from what well, I've heard. And at the end of the day, if you're constantly keeping track of that risk assessment and that risk matrix, it doesn't really matter the type of vehicles that you have. They, Again, I was not involved in this. I'm obviously reading it through the book. And from what I understand, though, of military operations, that element 
was not being tasked in a manner that was commensurate with what they were equipped to do. And I'm not talking about their trucks, even though that did play a factor in it. But just the size of the element in and of itself, the fact that they were out there at the Kazvac time was what it was. The air support was what it was. The weather was what it was. The, the distances, the, the vehicles were, were the least of the concern. Like the, the risk assessment and matrix, they were so outside of the envelope of and what I consider, and I can only speak for myself, to be that level of acceptable risk that, you know, yeah, cool, get the guys some new trucks and some new tires. But let's talk about how this actually came down the chain of command and landed with people's boots on the ground. That that to me would be where you, if you want to make a huge change, that's where you devote your time and energy mm-hmm. and interest. But I do, it goes back to, I think, the biggest thing that they could have done differently was have an organization outside of AFRICOM do the investigation because, I mean, otherwise you're kind of investigating yourself. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and that's been a big, a big statement that a lot of people have made that's I mean it's it's obvious why would AFRICOM investigate AFRICOM and I mean it also makes you wonder it's very suspicious when the three-star command SOC Africa starts the investigation and that gets instantly shut down by AFRICOM that's a huge red flag and then AFRICOM, did they ever give a reason for doing so no they just shut it shut it down from nothing that I could find. Mm-hmm. I was just told that that's what happened. That's what went down. And AFRICOM started its own investigation. Interesting. Yeah. How much does your faith help you get through this? A lot. I mean, that's pretty much everything, you know. That's how, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you and uh, Brian met through the church, right? We did, yeah. Um, I went to this small little, you know, uh, like ski bomb church, and uh, he showed Please up one night. Please tell me that was the name of it. <laughs> no, I don't even remember what it was called now that I think about it. Oh, it was called the Lighthouse, which yeah. didn't really belong in a ski town, but there you go. I mean, you could put a lighthouse on a mountaintop. I don't I don't know, know why, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the purpose would be, but you could totally do that. You could, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we went there. Uh, I ran into him. He's sitting at the back just looking totally out of place because that was Brian. He just, like, was bigger than everybody, and he had yeah. he was a fighter, so he had this big round neck and just wearing his crew neck shirt when everyone was wearing their baggy clothes. And so, yeah. How much do you think his faith— helped him in the execution of his job Uh, that was a huge part i think it it, you know he was i know all the guys i talked to they um said he ran a bible study over there etc um but i do think the his faith kind of helped him in every aspect of his life uh he was very disciplined um uh yeah I i think a lot of the principles he learned from um from the bible and and from his faith really helped him stay um solid i ask because i've just i was taken to what would they call it uh sunday school when i was younger and i don't know what it is for me it it never stuck i've never been a religious person um the most accurate description of myself i think could be agnostic i have absolutely Mm -hmm. no idea um about most things in life religion (laughs) specifically but i serve with and i serve with every version from devoutly religious to probably people who consider themselves to be slightly atheist slash anarchists, even though I don't think anarchists is a religion. Um, and oftentimes I was, I was envious of the framework that the faith would help when it came to supporting people through difficult times. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've seen, I've seen it multiple times throughout my life and, I'm of a I'm of a belief that you shouldn't try to fake things, and so for me, it like I said, it's just never stuck. But it's uh, it's something that I will ask about when I encounter people who go through difficult things like this and mm-hmm. have that have that faith. And I'm just curious, you know, how yeah. much you thought it was beneficial or not. Well, I know I didn't really grow up in the church. In fact, the first time I I mean I went when I was little, my parents just quit going. So I think the first time I went to church, church, I was maybe 20. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, um, growing up, my grandma would go to her house and she'd just talk about God and how he just wanted the best for you and he was always with you. And it was just kind of like you always just 
had somebody there to lean on. And so you built this relationship and um, it was with God and, and yeah, he just kind of lead you through things. And, and that was it. I never really went to church before then. Brian grew up, his parents were involved in the church and whatever. But I always felt like when I went to church, I was pretending to be someone else. And, and I was, yeah. yeah, I didn't really fit with that. So I never really quite fit at church. I tried, but after a while, I, I don't know. I can't pretend very well, and I get tired of feeling like it's exhausting. Like, like I'm around people who are pretending. Yeah. yeah so, uh, I I go in and out. Um, I do enjoy it sometimes, but um, but yeah, Brian and I we weren't very consistent consistent with church either. But, I don't think um, church and faith are necessarily connected. Yeah. So I feel like I, like I know the God of the Bible and, and Jesus and, and that's who I've got the relationship with. And that's why when things get hard and, you know, I, I feel a lot of those old things that I learned when I went to church a lot will come back. Those sayings, you know, that that you're going to be OK. I've always gotten you through all of this. You're going to be good. Like, you know, you're mine. You're going to be, you know, I've got a plan. And, and so it's like, that's right. You know, he always gets me through everything and I'm, I'm going to be OK. And like he had a plan for Brian's life. I feel like everybody has a set amount of time on this earth. And when they're done, that's it. And I think sometimes we can live on borrowed time. We can pray for a little extra time and he'll give it to us. But I do think he has a set amount of time for each of us. And that gives me a lot of peace because I'm like, well, you know, maybe Brian was only supposed to live to 35. And if he was going to go out at 35, this is how he would have chosen to go out. So God was just being faithful in in, uh, in that maybe. And um, that's all I can ask for is that, you know, we I'm able to transition into finding the positive and leaning on him and, and moving forward and doing something positive to help other people. Because really, when you go through something this hard, you have to know that you are helping other people um, and you're doing something good to serve others to help yourself heal. And um, and you have to know that God has something good on the other side. Brian did a lot with his 35 years. Yeah. He was swinging a big bat, sounds like. Very good at a lot of things. Yeah. What's your second book going to be about? Oh, gosh. I don't even know <laughs> about how long it took me to come up with a You're an a author subject. now. This is, what, this is what you do now. This is what I do. Yep. <laughs> do you have anything else that would interest you to write about? Um, you know, I don't know yet. I know that I love nonfiction. I've always loved reading nonfiction, and I would love to write another story. One of my favorite things when I was writing this was getting to interview the guys and then turn what they told me into stories. And even one um, where I sat down and there's a section on Casey in there where I talk about the um, the flag he covered Brian's body with mm -hmm. body, uh, and, and how he covered all the bodies. And that was, it was such an incredible thing to take it from an interview with him that was really just um, really a pretty personal interview and then to be able to turn that into a, a story and give it to him was um i think it did a lot for both of us um, i don't see how it couldn't yeah yeah and so the, i i loved being able to put into words what they were feeling and what they had gone through and i'd love to do that for more people so if, if i do another book i'd like it to be something where i get to do that again where I interview people and put their life into words for them. Have you been able to go back to Arlington and visit Brian's grave? I haven't. That's a long, long ways away, but I, I plan on doing it hopefully this summer. I need to, uh, <clears throat> I need to get back out there as well. I ask because I'm, I'm starting to think about putting a trip on my, my schedule as well to, to go out and spend time there. I've been there before and, uh, it it's if I'm being totally honest, I avoid it because it's so hard. Yeah. Um just even even standing there without going and visiting actual graves, just standing there uh, among as you well know, a sea, a literal sea of headstones. Um it rattles me for a while, a couple of days, it maybe even a couple of weeks, but it's it's time to go back for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think you'll go back by yourself or you take your sons? I don't know. Um, I'll probably ask them. For me, the last time I went was with them, and they it was just, you know, maybe a few months after Brian had died. Yeah. Um, we went back in April of that year. And uh, that was really hard. And I think to some degree, I've also avoided it because of how hard. hard it was. Yeah. Um, you set foot on the, it's such hollow ground. You set foot on that property and it just, for me, it feels like it's just a ton of bricks just smashing down on my shoulders. Yeah. yeah. So there's not enough alcohol in DC for me for the next few days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's, that's a very way, good way to describe it. It's a uh, very overwhelming uh, yeah. and not in a, not in a good way. It's. No. But I think it's. I think the difficulty is it directly speaks to the importance of going back, and it's. It's. Uh, I would like to think that I have gotten a, a better understanding of who I am now that I'm at the wise age of forty four, much older than I ever thought I would be alive. <laughs> if I'm being honest, yeah. Um, but I don't. I. I, tr I don't know why my brain works the way that it does. I don't know why I think about the things that I do, but. I have started to try to pay attention to repetitive thoughts that I have or like dreams. Like maybe there is I'm trying to tell myself something. Mm. Um, and one of them that's been coming up is, is to go back and make sure I take the time. So, <sighs> yeah, that's a hard one, though. It that's, is. That's a good one to ignore. It's amazing know? how I can find <laughs> any other website other than Delta dot com when I'm thinking about doing that. I'm like, hmm, let's just go over here. And yeah, yeah. no, it's it. It's important. I think it. It's something that I need to do, and it's something I want to expose my kids to at some point in time. But I need to go back, I think, first by myself, and then I'll and then I'll go take them. And I want to be able to, as I walk through, tell them about the people mm -hmm. that were visiting and what they and what they meant to me. And I know right now I wouldn't be able to get through that. I would be an absolute mess. And you know, I want to be a better example and a, and a better storyteller for them when the time comes. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, even even the emotion is good for the kids to see. I have to remember that sometimes my kids seeing that part of me allows them to to um, be able to feel the things that they need to feel honestly. I know since losing Brian, I, well, my youngest, he doesn't, won't cry, won't, you know. Um, and so I've, you know, recently been talking to him about the times, you know, I brought up, I said, you know, your dad cried couple times when we were married over different things i mean he was shocked mm -hmm. why would my, my dad my you know and i thought you know i think that's important for him to know i still remember the first time my dad cried and i was like 18 and i found out about it and i was like shocked but i thought that's i think it's important i mean not that I'm all, you know, gay men cry. No, but um, I, I, but I do think like your kids being able to see that sometimes is important, not because you want them doing that all the time, but because there are times it's so that they know that there is there are times when that's the appropriate response. And I think you need to see your parents as humans as well and not yeah. a pillar of perfection because let me just tell you that's a ticking time bomb until you're let down by that one <laughs> right if that's the pedestal you put them on for sure yeah um we have talked for almost three hours and not mentioned the name of your book a single time oh wow yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> is it out yet i believe i got an early copy right well this is actually this is out this is the hardback um and the the paperback is coming out with a reworked cover. So the new cover has a picture of the team with uh, the trucks and the red smoke. So um, because I realized people pick this up and they think that it's all about uh, like grief and loss and widowhood. And, and really the majority of this story, probably the last two thirds of the book is it's all about the ambush. Yeah. The detailed it's breakdown about the of the ambush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found it to be much more, um, how would I describe it? Your personal journey to find out exactly what happened and why. Yeah. And I and when I when I first released it, I was thinking, you know, a lot of people keep buying it, saying to me, oh, I'll buy this to support the widow type of attitude. And I thought, this isn't a book on widowhood. You're not going to get in or not want to read it because it's all about the widow and grief. That's that's not what this is. This yeah. is this is about 
Niger. And I thought I, I need to put a, a cover on it that will let people know that. So the book is called Sacrifice. Yes. A gold For star. those of you joining us two hours and 50. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A gold star's widow fight for the truth. Um, where can people buy it? I'm assuming Amazon, it, local bookstores. You tell me. This is where you get to put on your marketer hat. Oh, all right. <laughs> there we go. Um, so you can find it everywhere. It's uh, Amazon. You got uh, Kindle, Audible, and hardback. And May 10th, it will be available in paperback. Awesome. Um, and pretty much everywhere books are sold. Um, it's in the biography section at Barnes and Noble. Um, it took me a while to figure out it was in the biography section <laughs> so but i know i thought that was odd i would have put it in the military history section maybe yeah so maybe you know why they didn't have any space all the stupid seal books that's what i hear yeah yeah it's terrible <laughs> you know what i do when i go to those books i move them oh do you really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah so well hopefully the next one will be the first green beret book in the seal section i'll put it and, there. Um, I, there's a barnes and noble down in missoula and i'm gonna be down there i think in a week and a half and i will go in there and find it and put it like it'll go like seal book green beret seal book green beret seal book and i will take a picture and send it to you Perfect. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. So yeah, you can find it in um, in uh, pretty much everywhere books are sold and online. You know, yeah. everywhere online. So in this digital world yeah. that we live in. But the most important thing is, if you read it, go on Amazon or wherever Goodreads and um, review. rate it. Yeah. yeah, rate it and review it. Okay. And specifically with five stars. Of course. <laughs> Every time. It should be the only option, right? Yeah. Why is there yeah. even, why are the, what are these other stars? It's five or five. Yeah, just five or don't <laughs> review it. <laughs> well, I want to make sure you have time to get to the airport. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming here and talking to me about this. I mean, obviously the subject matter is very close to you. Probably not the easiest thing to uh, rehash yet again, but I think it'll be very imp impactful for people. The book, like I said, it's, it's a great read. It was hard for me to read because of my own personal experience and just kind of chunking it up, but it's an important book and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. I really do. Anytime. How would you like to, uh, close it out? Do you do social media at all? Can people find you I there? I do. Yeah. I'm all over. Um, Instagram is the one I'm on the most. So Michelle black seven one on Instagram Okay. or, um, author Michelle black. If you're a Facebook, Facebook person. Cool. Yep. And at this day and age, they're owned by the same people anyway. So it's, they are. It's, yeah. Metaverse. Yeah. Have you bought any property yet in the metaverse? Oh, Lord. No. <laughs> I'm totally joking. <laughs> I only say that because I saw some I was sc scrolling through the news today. It's like metaverse beachside property sells for it was like hundreds of thousands of real dollars. And I had to click on it to make yeah. sure that it was what I thought it was, which is a digital beachside property that Can, exists somewhere. It's like bouncing off of us right now in the internet world and somebody paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for it. Can you get a sunburn there? If you somehow can like enter your computer, like and <laughs> like teleport inside of it. I don't, I don't yeah, get it. I don't yeah. either. And I'm terrified for the direction that we're headed. <laughs> I know. I know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michelle. I'll get you to the airport. Um, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Hey, you're welcome.